Boleh cari. <laughs> Okay, good morning, Mr. Joran. I think that most of everyone is here. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit the classroom, the regulations in Vietnamese, and then I will hand over the class to you. So just give me like two minutes. À, xin chào tất cả các anh chị ạ đã join kể cả ở lớp hoặc là online. Ạ. Thì em sẽ giới thiệu một chút là hôm nay là lớp uh, quản lý rủi ro nâng cao. À, bởi thầy Joran thì tí nữa thầy sẽ giới thiệu về các kinh nghiệm của thầy cũng như là À, những cái khóa học, những cái mục tiêu của học sau ạ, à, em chỉ giới thiệu qua một chút thôi. thì hôm nay lớp học sẽ bắt đầu từ lúc 9 giờ và buổi sáng thì là 9 giờ đến 12 giờ và chúng ta sẽ có một tiếng rưỡi nghỉ trưa và là 12 giờ đến 1 giờ 30. Xong rồi chúng ta sẽ quay lại 1 giờ 30 và đến 4 giờ 30 ạ. À. thì đấy là lịch trình học của hôm nay. thì trong khóa kỳ quá trình học thì sẽ cũng có sẽ có những breaks nhỏ nhỏ. À, thì bọn em dựa vào trên những cái thông tin mà đã được cung cấp về các anh chị thì bọn em cũng đã chia nhóm rồi. tại vì trong cả quá trình học sẽ có những nhóm thảo luận nên là các anh chị sẽ được vào từng nhóm theo từng đã được chia với mong muốn của thầy giáo và để được thảo luận dạng thì tí nữa sẽ chắc là một số anh chị sẽ phải join vào zoom để tại vì có một số anh chị là cùng nhóm với những người online nữa đấy à, nên là sẽ đầu còn à, và sẽ không có phiên dịch viên một trăm phần trăm bạn thì sẽ thầy sẽ giảng một trăm phần trăm tiếng anh thôi thì các bạn sẽ vâng các, à, sẽ có người dịch bằng qua chat box của zoom còn nếu mà các anh chị nào không thể hiểu nữa thì bọn em sẽ nhảy vào để hỗ trợ phiên dịch còn sẽ không có như kiểu là những năm trước là thầy nói một đoạn xong rồi là sẽ có một đoạn điểm hạch tiêm kẹt lại thay đổi một chút cho năm nay à, và thầy cũng mong muốn là mọi người có thể là à, phát biểu và cũng hỏi câu hỏi nếu mà không hiểu đoạn nào cứ dừng luôn và thầy dừng luôn thầy có thể giảm lại cái đoạn đấy à, không có vấn đề gì à, và nếu mà anh chị nào cho online mà muốn phát biểu thì vui lòng bật mic và bật cam luôn để thầy có thể nhìn thấy Okay, um, so Joran, I have introduced briefly about the regulations and the way that we're going to run the class. So I will hand over the class to you. Thank you, Tian. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the course. Um, clearly, we're working under unusual circumstances. Not only am I six hours different time zone and many, many miles away. Um, but everyone else, you're all spread out, some in a classroom, many it looks like in your own offices, um, certainly Cambodia as well as Vietnam. So, and then some people are wearing masks and we're all, I guess, still getting used to this new world where we um, work virtually together a lot. Um, but that's great in that we can interact, uh, but clearly that can create problems. So I think as we start, we have to allow ourselves some leeway, some room to learn how best to interact during the course. Um, I will start by, if you don't mind, I'll introduce myself. And then if I could ask people to briefly introduce themselves not so much to me because I have a list of who's in the class, but to everyone else so we can all understand uh, that each person is perhaps coming from a different part of the group, a different part of the airline, a different role, engineering, safety, whatever. Um, and so sort of get a sense of the group that we will be for the next two days. Okay. Um, just to make sure everyone's in the right Zoom, we're, we're here to, as you will see on the slide when I share it, uh, to discuss and explore advanced risk management. Can everyone see the, can someone give me a thumbs up? Is the screen showing correctly? Yes, it is. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another remark I'll say is, uh, clearly, I'm speaking in English, um, and I appreciate it's not your first language. Um, I got politely laughed at when I tried to express some Vietnamese uh, terms last year. So if you will excuse me, <laughs> I won't try too hard, um, because I know I'd get it wrong. Um, but I see on the list that there are some people with with professional level of English and others with advanced level. 
So I suspect I'm not the most advanced English speaker amongst the group, as I'm actually Welsh by birth. Uh, if anyone has difficulty understanding either what I am saying or what I am trying to explain, and please raise your hand virtually or wave, um, and we'll see if we can express it in different ways. Uh, some of the concepts are quite complicated, um, quite nuanced uh, involved. So there are bound to be times where you may not follow what I'm trying to say. And I may seek someone else to, to explain it in a slightly different way, if I may. So firstly, welcome very much. Welcome to Advanced Risk Management. Now, please don't be frightened by the word advanced. Um, the original intention was that everyone on this course will have attended the previous one, which was about a year or two ago. Uh, that isn't the way it's happened. So I have put in some early work, which is more fundamental. So hopefully we can bring everyone up to a similar standard before we explore the more complicated aspects of risk management. Okay. Uh, just uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm an engineer by training, um, and I started my career in the nuclear business, the nuclear submarine uh, technology um, with the British Navy. Um, so obviously a very complicated field, but the most important point is it's very risky. It's um, a complex and risky business. And so that is my foundation in risk. Um, but I emigrated to New Zealand about 25 years ago and became a risk engineer uh, and then started to work for Air New Zealand in a number of risk fields, including operational risk, internal audit, and technical risk and compliance. Um, and that's my, my aviation, how I started in aviation. Um, and I've been now in aviation for perhaps nearly 20 years. Um, my other background is I assisted in the writing of the international standards on risk management. And we'll be talking about standards in due course. Um, that was a excellent uh, experience because you have people from all around the world all trying to agree on a technical subject. And it took five years to write the international standard. Um, but it was excellent experience to understand different cultural backgrounds to risk, different ways of exploring risk in different languages and the like. Um, so that's essentially my background. Uh, and I would say the most exciting period of my career has been aviation and particularly um, airlines. Uh, my experience with Air New Zealand an, an airline not dissimilar in size to Vietnam Airways uh, Airlines. Um, and we were going for a big change, bringing on new aircraft, new executive team, um, new ways of th thinking, new culture. Uh, so a lot of risk. And so it was a very exciting time to be involved. So a summary, a, a range of experience, um, but the key constant in my career has been risk and the fact that you have to explore what can go wrong or explore the uncertainties of the future and work out how to manage those uncertainties to ensure success. And I think it's important to remember that risk management is really success management. It's about ensuring success. So that's my own background. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to do this, Tian, um, how we're going to control, but if everyone could give some indication of their own backgrounds, um, ideally the name you want to be known as, um, your role in the airline. And if you have any formal experience 
or training in risk management um, and perhaps where you're calling from. Yeah, and how, how do you think we can manage this? Do you think we can do this? Yes, we did this yep. before actually, yeah. Okay. We, we, uh, so actually we're gonna start with the main room. So everyone who's in the main room in the classroom right now will start first. Yes. Okay, à, thì thầy muốn giới, mọi người giới thiệu bản thân một chút thôi. Thì mọi người có thể đi quanh vòng giới thiệu tên này. Mình có thể nói chút, chút về experience cũng được ạ. À. Nhìn của mọi người. À, thực ra cái loan mọi người phải nói hướng về hướng này này. Thì thầy mới nghe được ạ. <cười> Hi everyone. My name is Nguyễn Thị Liễu. I work in the planning and marketing department. Um, um, I was uh, in Vietnam and I was for 20 years so. 20 years. Uh, and um, now I work in uh, uh, space control centers. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, Joran, did you hear that? I heard most of it, but um, I couldn't work out who on my list it was, but maybe I won't try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Ban, E-A-N-G. I'm working for the United Airlines for 25 years as a cabin crew. I'm working in the uh, cabin crew division and uh, mostly in the uh, uh, safety uh, uh, sphere. That's all, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hai Ang, and I'm from uh, Human Resource Development uh, Training Division. Uh, so um, I hope that uh, we will gain um, useful knowledge and uh, exciting uh, experience, experience uh, today with uh, you guys. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hai. I'm from uh, Technical Department. Uh, I've been working here for the department for uh, over 10 years already. So nice to meet you all, and I hope uh, I can gain a lot of experience and uh, knowledge in this class. Thank you. Yep. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Mr. Wu. I come from uh, Tatai, Malaysia. And I uh, look at um, um, uh, and Hi everyone, my name is Donai. Uh, I'm working for the Dakadai uh, over 20 years ago. Now my work is to handle the uh, insurance, a vision of this uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Chang, number 18 in the list. I'm working for a strategy of an MLI uh, around eight, 17 or 18 years of working experience. So my experience is on route planning and, uh, and then fleet planning and strategy for the company. So the risk issue is one of the case that uh, we want and our team want to know and have more experience on this. So to hope that after this course, we do we will know how to to set out uh, some risk issues uh, that we should consider in our study in our research and study. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is Mr. Wick uh, from Cambodia, Uncle Air from Cambodia. And uh, my name is uh, Mr. Wick. I'm the last on the list, the last name on the list from Cambodia, Uncle Air. And uh, I work for uh, 21 years for airline operation and uh, 16 years for airport operation and uh, five years for safety, quality and security department. So uh, I'm the auditor for I was auditor. Also. Uh, Vic, I think you mute. Yeah. Sorry, you, you should unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good morning. Are you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm called from Cambodia. Um, my name is uh, Mr. Vic. You can call me Mr. Vic. And uh, I work for 24 years for airline uh, industry and 16 years for airport operation and five years for actual safety, quality and security department. And uh, I hope this course can get me more knowledge about the risk management. And uh, I hope uh, I can work uh, with the team and with the Vietnam Airline uh, people there, yeah, staff. And uh, I think uh, we will go in two days and uh, we uh, will see how the training cost doing. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Zoom. I'm from Flight Training Center in Ho Chi Minh City. I've been working for Vietnam Airlines for 25 years as a flight attendant. And now I'm an, an instructor of a cabin safety and fatigue risk management for crew members. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Hello everyone, is, uh, my name is uh, Fan Hu Hua. 
and uh, hello yes yep. yes okay um sorry as my mix is i have a problem okay so this um uh, my name is fan was and uh, right now the um I've been uh, working for uh, Vietnam Airlines nearly 20 years as the pilot. And uh, I have a uh, four year of uh, um, task of the flight training center as the uh, quality staff. And uh, today's, uh, I hope the, uh, I can share some uh, experience of uh, risk uh, assessment during the uh, flight operation and also in the training operation. And uh, after the course, I hope I uh, can uh, find some more knowledge and uh, understanding of the uh, risk assessment. Uh, thank you. Hello. No, I can hear you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hong, um, number 23 in the list. I'm a um, station manager in uh, Dubai Airport, the city. And I work for Vietnam Airlines in uh, uh, 17 years. And uh, I hope that uh, after this call, I will uh, it's, uh, apply the knowledge of uh, risk management for the reality in my work. Thank you, and uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Good morning, teacher. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm um, Liu Tiong. I'm from Hanoi. I am number uh, two in the lead. I have been an executive in the quality, uh, safety quality uh, department for over 15 years. I work as uh, a quality uh, safety auditor in crowd and cargo handling area. At the responsibility of the uh, safety and quality department, or we always coordinate with our relevant de departments and unit in risk management of safety issue. Especially in the last two years, uh, affected by the COVID epidemic, BNA has implemented some new approach, uh, exploitation, such as transporting cargo in cabin or hauling cabin bag kits and so on. So we have already performed chain management and assess the risk of those chains. Avoid uh, this court, I hope we get more knowledge to do better as my risk management. Thank you for Hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Tan. I'm from Thomson Yuk Cargo Company and uh, I have been working in aviation for three years. So I think risk management to me is uh, I have uh, just have a little experience. So I think after this card, I can get more knowledge about risk management and can apply this information into uh, identify risk and handle them better in the future. Thank you. Good morning, sir, <coughs> and everybody. My name is Lady Tang. I'm speaking from Nobel Airport. I'm uh, number one in group four. I'm working in cargo department of the time life in Nobel Airport. I have two years experience in this management. Nice to join class today. Thank you. Morning, sir. Hi, everyone. My name is Hien. 
uh, I work in the safety and quality department. My job is executive about technical. Um, my company is uh, Vietnam, Vietnam service company. It's a branch of uh, Vietnam Airlines at Ho Chi Minh City. Um, uh, of course, I'm speaking from Ho Chi Minh City. Nice to meet you. That's all. Good morning, sir. Hi, everyone. I'm Lê Hữu Quý. I'm working for the Quality Control Department, Scarpec 1000 brand in Ho Chi Minh City. My experience with SMS is two months. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Good morning, teacher. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, my name's uh, Wong, uh, Q U I N. Yeah, I work uh, at a Pacific Airlines uh, Safety and Quality Department. And so uh, I uh, work in uh, aviation more than ten years. Um, based in the technical uh, aircraft uh, engineer for A320. So um, I uh, have after this course, I have a uh, enough uh, knowledge to uh, work in the uh, submarines like you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you all, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, Mr. Jaron. Yeah, good morning, class. My name is Zoom. I zoom in, zoom out in camera. Um, I'm joined Vietnam uh, Airlines in 1994. At present, uh, um, I am a captain on the Airbus 350. Uh, my home base is in Ho Chi Minh. I'm in charge of the safety of the 350 uh, fleet. And uh, I hope after today, uh, I will understand, I got able to understand more about the risk management from the, the teacher and also from the old staff in the class. And uh, nice to meet you all. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Nguyễn Thị Mai Thủy from Nội Bài Operations Center. I'm uh, uh, yes. the number 11 and uh, I have my 11 experience in uh, um, risk management, uh, management of uh, Nội Bài Operations Center. Thank you. Hello, teacher and everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, my name is Oanh Lu Thị Ngọc Oanh. I am number 25. I am deputy, uh, deputy general manager from sales, uh, passenger sales and marketing of the Southern Regional Branch. I've been between, uh, working for Vietnam Airlines uh, about uh, 28 years, a long time. My, my experience, uh, this is the first time I attend this course like this. So I hope I can have knowledge to apply every uh, very efficiently in uh, my workplace. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Shishan and everyone. I uh, currently I'm working at the Tasmania Airport. Uh, service. Sorry, do you hear me, Mr. Shishan? Yes. We can yes. Hear. Uh, yeah. Currently, I'm working at the uh, quality management department. Uh, I have a chance to read a lot of report concerning risk management, but I haven't done any report for myself. So I hope this change, I will get the knowledge and experience from um, Dr. Zoran and everyone in the class uh, to apply for my current job and in the future. Thank you.
Con ai muốn giới thiệu được các bạn? Chúng ta bắt đầu. Uh, Mr. Joran, I think that's it for everyone that would like to introduce themselves. So uh, if you, we can go back to the classroom, uh, to the PowerPoint and just start the class. That'd be great. Uh, Joran, I think you are mute right now. We cannot hear you. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much for those introductions. It was really interesting to understand the breadth of experience in the room, as well as how much experience is in the room. There's some people who have worked for the airline or the airport or both <laughs> um, uh, for many, many years. So, so I think it's important that um, some of that experience comes through into the course. So at times, if you have, feel you have something to contribute, something to add to the discussion, then please do so. Um, there's so much experience, we need to make the most of that. So that would be really useful if you don't mind, just put your hand up or wave. Uh, if you think you have something that will contribute to the discussion, or the points being made. Uh, it's also interesting to see the range of roles. Um, I've just written a few down like security, auditing, um, pilots, cabin crew, quality assurance, engineering, uh, airports as well as the airline. Um, it goes on and on, a great range of experience and technical knowledge professional knowledge. So again, if you have something to add to a conversation, then please, please do so as we work through the course. I think it was really useful for people who said what they wanted to come out of a course. Um, and I think what I could, my summary of that is what most people are looking for, if not everyone, is the knowledge and skills to apply risk management in practice, to have something useful to, to take back to your departments and your roles. Um, so I'll keep trying to remember to, to explore practical application of risk management. There is some theory in the course, but only sufficient to understand the principles. Uh, and then we keep going back and I'll try and remind myself to do so, to applied risk management to examples of how it's done in practice. So you can hopefully at the end of the course, apply your new knowledge in your roles and in your departments. Okay, um, thank you again. And so we'll, so I'm still trying to work out how to operate this PowerPoint. Here we go. Um, so this slide sets out the objective, the aims of the course, and it's to develop a good working level understanding of general risk management as applicable or as applied to all parts of a complex business and to form a foundation for the development of core expertise in risk management across the group. So if this isn't what you're expecting, then please let me know. Um, but I think that the important point is a good working level uh, of applied risk management. Okay, is there anything that's missing from that objective that people were hoping perhaps would be the objective of a course? Why mong muốn tiêu khác không ạ? Ngoài cửa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is someone trying to say something? I don't think so, no. No, okay. Radio. Okay, this next slide, which you should be seeing, is the agenda um, for the course, what we hope to cover. So the first part of the course is the fundamentals of risk as opposed to risk management. 
what do we mean by this word risk? Um, and to understand what we mean by risk, um, we'll look at the, a little bit, uh, just very briefly, at the history of risk management. We will spend quite a bit of time on the international standard on risk management, international standard ISO 31000. And it's a relatively new edition, 2018. The original edition was 2009 but they have not changed much. Um, as part of that, we will look at the principles of effective risk management. Uh, that word effective is really important. Um, it's important that you don't go through the process of risk management, but it's not effective. It's got to be a practical and, and useful. And as part of that, having explored the principles we will then look at the risk management process, which is the, shall we say, the everyday process to, do, to carry out risk assessment uh, as part of managing risk. Um, so that's the fundamentals, the first part of the course. Then we'll look at applying the principles, but um, there's 11 principles I'll be covering. We'll look at the theory of how you measure risk, how you uh, consider the level of risk, um, and then go through each of the building blocks of the risk management process. So that's a general part of the course. We'll then use what we've learned and apply it within an airline setting or group setting, airline, airport, cargo, whichever part. And then we'll go through a process of assessing risks um, before finally closing the course. Now, given that we are in the middle of a pandemic um, and it will have a little way to go yet, it would seem, um, we. What I'm proposing is that we actually explore risks of the post-pandemic period, the recovery from the pandemic. Not exclusively, um, not just those risks, but I think it will be a very useful exercise for everyone if we do put some time tomorrow into considering what risks there are of a recovery from a pandemic. Now I've added this part of the course because already we are seeing problems being created as airlines are re-establishing routes, re-establishing operations. Um, and there's been a number of incidents already in the large airlines. Qantas, for example, have had an it's quite a significant incident, which you can trace back to not fully understanding the risks of re-establishing operation. So although I don't want to concentrate just on pandemic because running an airline is full of risks uh, that must be managed, I think it will be useful for everyone if we do spend some time looking at the implications, the process of recovery from a pandemic in an airline setting. So uh, again, uh, that's my proposed agenda. Uh, is there something that people would like to add to this? We have some time. So is there something, please say, if you were expecting to see something in the agenda that is not there? No? OK. Okay, that's no reason that if you do feel you want to explore something, um, but we cannot change this. We can spend some time, we have time, we can spend some time exploring a particular point of risk management or type of risk or anything that you want to re recover. Cover again if you don't think you quite understood something, and again, please say so. Uh, either during a break or 
lunchtime um, or at the end of today. That would be very useful. Um, actually, um, Tian, does everyone have a time frame for the course? Have we? Yes, we do have a yeah. time frame for the course. So as we discussed, um, we have a lunch break at 12. Um, and then we will come back to class at 1.30. So it's one hour and a half lunch break. Okay. Then, yeah. But we can have 15 minutes break in the morning as well. So usually um, the break is at one at 10.30. That will be the first break, the short 15 minutes break. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, before I go on, am I speaking clearly enough? Um, my English is not perfect. <laughs> so, um, it's an accent of Welsh and Scottish and New Zealand accent mixed in. So again, if I'm not clear, um, please say so or send a note and I'll try and re recap on anything that's not clear. Thank you very well. Very good. Thank you. I'm mindful that someone I think has a master's in English, so <laughs> I'm being careful. <laughs> okay. So this is a part I'm not sure it's going to work again. Is I was hoping that people would would discuss um, what the, their perception of risk is. So maybe we ask for volunteers, people just to say uh, from time to time, just pick your moment and just say what you think risk means to you. Just the word, the concept of risk. Would someone like to start? Anyone? So for example, do you, when you hear the word risk, um, do you think of danger or do you think of excitement or do you think of roulette wheel and gambling anyone got something to say about risk no <laughs> Yes. Someone thinks it's danger. Danger. Okay. That's what I was expecting to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Any any other words? Unstable. Unstable. Interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Excitement. So I missed that. I say excitement. Excitement. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, the bonus is free. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So there's somebody. Mm -hmm. For me, the risk is something bad that may happen anytime. Bad, bad, right. Any other words, people? We are uh, we think about a uh, consequence. Sorry, what was that? Uh, uh, consequence. Consequence. Yes. Mm. I think this is uh, something uh, when uh, when wrong uh, um, out of your um, uh, your plan in advance. Wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Fault. Yeah. Okay. That that's probably sufficient. Um, this is always going to be a little difficult. Everyone split up. But so we've got words like danger, unstable, excitement, consequence, 
bad, sort of wrong. Um, so this is what I was expecting to hear, uh, but it's really good that some, I, I was expecting to hear sort of a negative, a danger, a bad side, but it was really interesting the word excitement came up. There is a, a positive side to risk. Um, so if you're in business, uh, commercial business, uh, starting a new business, you're taking risk, but invariably you're probably quite excited because you're hoping to gain something from a risk. Um, so it's, it, this is a really important point uh, and it comes through in the risk management standard very strongly. Um, we'll see in a, in a little while that risk can be perceived as all downside, but there is an element of upside to risk. And so you've probably heard the term upside risk. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that an airline, in particular an airline, you have to explore and appreciate risk in many different ways. Um, if we were just frightened of risk, you wouldn't run an airline. <laughs> um, because every day you, the, the business is taking risk, the business is taking risk, not just operationally, uh, it's taking risk commercially, it's taking risk financially. Um, airlines are a very dynamic business um, that to be successful, you have to be able to manage all types of risk. Uh, and yet, also take risk, start in a new route, uh, create risk. It creates a commercial risk, it creates an operational risk. But you must create new routes from time to time to remain, to be tap in the correct market and to be successful in the future. And um, the most recent example I understand is a, a route right over to North America recently. Uh, that's incredible uh, to, to pull that off. Um, but if you were as a group frightened, entirely frightened of risk, you wouldn't do it, but you did, which suggests a very healthy understanding of risk. Does anyone have a comment on that? Does anyone disagree? No? We are reading yes. I think everyone <laughs> Sorry, was that someone's gonna say a comment? No, I think everyone no. yeah. Okay, radio. Okay. Um if we were working in groups in in a classroom, what I'd like to do would be to split people into tables, five or six people in a table, and give them to do a little quiz to see where they personally sat on what we could call a risk radar. We each have a different understanding of risk. And so this example here is how you can map a person's perception of risk. How strongly do they fear risk, for example? You could point, if they were very fearful, they would have a point here. If someone is very excited by risk, they would be over here. If a very conservative person, they might be weak on this axis, but strong on this axis. Some people sense risk in their private lives more strongly than perhaps in their professional life. And so you can have some people who are very uh, fearful of risk in a personal life. For example, they're very protective of their children uh, and yet are very willing to take risk in a work environment. But there are others, and I'm sure you can think of people who are very conservative at work, 
but maybe in their daily lives during holidays they actually take risk so we're, we're all different um and i often reflect on myself uh, i I've, I've took part in some of his professionally run surveys at Air New Zealand when I was a staff member. And they told me that I like to take controlled risk. That's what I said. Um, and interestingly, I'm, I'm learning to glide gliders at the moment and everyone looks surprised. They think, well, why would you do that? Why would you fly an airplane with no engine around the Southern Alps of New Zealand? They're big mountains covered in ice and snow and nowhere to land. Um, but for me, it's a challenge. So that's why I do it. Um, and interestingly, my children have grown up. So, OK, if I have an accident, they're not going to be hurt. I don't have to look after them anymore. So maybe my view of risk has changed as I've got older. Um, and the family have, have left home. Uh, but when people have young children, it's interesting that often they become quite risk adverse in their personal lives because they know the consequence of them having an accident is higher. It's higher for their children. So as we go through life, both our personal lives and our professional lives, our view of risk can change to, depending on our circumstances, our experiences, what we know, what we've learned, and perhaps incidents from a past where we've either become more confident or perhaps less confident. So risk is actually quite a complex percept, uh, concept. It's a very personal concept at times. And so the idea of this course is to try and give people the tools to be able to consistently measure risk, understand risk, measure risk, and consistently come to conclusions that can be applied in a professional setting. And to do so as a group, even if the group has many different perceptions of risks themselves, their own personal perceptions, we need tools to allow a group to come to a consistent way of measuring risk. So that, for example, if two different departments measure risk and the risk is reported up to the senior executives, they are getting a consistent message, a consistent understanding of risk. So that's why it's important to understand our own understanding of risk, but also to have the tools to consistently understand risk in a professional setting and measure it. Okay. Is there any comments on that? Anyone disagree? Anyone got an example perhaps of their own risk taking um, behaviors? Okay. But, uh, radio. Um, the next thing I was going to cover was um, as part of the fundamentals of risk is some of the history. Um, now, if anyone is particularly interested in the history of risk, I would very much recommend this book. Um, I wrote, I read it many years ago. Um, and maybe I feel I should read it again. Um, Peter Bernstein, staying as a guess, you may have guessed from his name, is American author. Um, he actually worked, I think, in the financial area, but uh, his understanding of risk is, is very, very good, very solid, and I think can be applied to any profession, any setting. So if anyone would like to spend a little time understanding, really understanding risk and risk management, 
I, I, like I say, I would very much recommend this book. Okay. Um, the history of risk can be traced back or the idea of risk being understood as a concept can be traced back many, many years. And one of the um, best examples of the textbooks talk about is how the Greeks uh, use of a word um, and the concept really traced back to their seafaring days in the Mediterranean in their triremes, their sailing and oar driven vessels, which in their day were the pinnacle of technology. Absolutely amazing vessels. Even today, we cannot understand how they could travel at the speeds they did. Very significant technology for the day. But it was dangerous to sail one of these craft and be confronted with a storm in the Mediterranean would have been very, very uh, frightening. And their term for risk really represented the hazards along a coastline, the rocks, the storms, um, even the sea monsters that people feared was their perception of risk. Um, and yet, they built these ships and they went and did battle in these ships and they traded in their ships despite the hazards of the Greek and Italian, the Mediterranean coastline as a whole. It can be a very dangerous sea. So that it's often when people talk about the history of risk uh, in a formal understanding of the word or the concept, the Greeks and the Greek seafaring days is often mentioned. I think from some of the history books, the, the water between southern Italy and Sicily uh, was particularly dangerous. It is a particularly dangerous sea. Um, and that was a very, you had to be quite brave at times to sail through that. Okay, let's go back. The, the first thing we're gonna talk about um, in the next few slides, once we've defined risk, is we'll cover the principles of risk management. Um, and that's covered in the international standard. We'll also, uh, this little diagram here, you won't be able to read it yet, but we'll come to it again includes the principles of risk management, talks about the framework of how you manage the application of risk management. And then also, and this is where we'll spend most of our time, is the process of risk management. So like I say, you won't be able to read this yet, but you'll be familiar with this diagram in due course. Okay, and then once we've done that, we will start working out how to measure risk and we'll use a tool called a risk matrix, which I'm sure many of you have heard the term risk matrix. And then we'll apply that in the airline. Okay. All right. For next step, we're going to um, define what we mean by risk. We've already explored the perceptions of risk, how it can be danger and instability, excitement, bad consequence, wrong, errors, faults, these all sorts of words. But um, the international standard is very clear that it try, what the international try, standard tries to do is work out what the word risk means for everyone, um, not just people in safety 
or people in business or people in insurance. But what is the fundamental meaning of a word risk? And I'll give a little bit of history here. The international standard ISO 31,010, sorry, 31,000, I beg your pardon, reflects very strongly an Australian New Zealand standard that was produced in the 1990s. 1995 was the draft of a standard. And that was the first standard that really got to the core of risk, what risk meant to everyone. And my own personal experience of that standard was, as I've said, I've come out of a nuclear engineering business originally. And so I'd been trained about risk. Uh, and I thought I knew quite a lot about risk management. But I picked up this Australian New Zealand standard that I had not seen before. And I quickly read it. It's a very short standard. And it certainly struck me that this was brilliant. It was the first time that a real meaning of risk had been explained to me, despite having had 20 years in a high risk environment myself. So um, would someone like to volunteer what they think the word risk means? Anyone? No, no one's going to offer. I don't need a risk one. You need a risk one. No. no. Okay. Okay. Radio. Um, this is a problem with um, with using Zoom. If everyone was in the room, I think it would be easier to to generate ideas. But never mind. Okay. So um, this is the formal definition of risk: the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So, did anyone know this? <laughs> did anyone know this was a formal definition of risk? No. Okay. It's probably not what most people expected to see. It's a strange definition most people would think when they first see it. The effect of uncertainty on objectives. Now, there's a couple of really interesting points here. Sorry, let's try to get my slides sorted out here. There's two words in particular that are really important here. Um, the first is uncertainty. And the second, or maybe the first should be, I should say, is objectives, and the second is uncertainty. We cannot understand risk unless we know what our objectives are. And I'll come to what that means. And uncertainty is a result of risk is always about the future. It's always something that hasn't happened yet. Um, and so we cannot predict the future. We can only have a level of confidence in the future, what we think will happen. And so that's why the word uncertainty is important. If we are very uncertain about meeting our objectives, then we say we have high risk. If we are very confident that we're going to meet our objectives, then we can say we have low risk. The objectives is really important because 
how can, for example, a person who's starting a business and is borrowing money, has high debt to start a business, when they say, I am facing a lot of risk or high amount of risk, that's not the same as an engineer fixing an airplane and saying, I followed procedures, there is low risk that this will fail. In that case, the engineer is talking about the aircraft not performing or even the aircraft being unsafe. But the first person, the business person, was talking about commercial risk. Very different, very different types of risk. But what is common is that each had an understanding of what their, their objective was. So the business person's objective is to be successful in business, successful in their company. The engineer's understanding of objectives was the aircraft will be fit for service. This aircraft is ready for flight. Very different objectives and therefore their meaning of risk is very different, but they are both correct in their use of the word risk. That's because each has got a different objective. The important point when we talk about risk is we understand what the objective is, because unless we do, what are we talking about? Two people could talk, say, use the same words that mean very different things. So that's why this word objective is so important. And the uncertainty is it because we're always talking about the future. We are very interested in the past because the past gives us the knowledge to predict or try and predict or have confidence in the future. It is the past that teaches us. It is our lessons, but it is a future that we are interested in. Does that make sense? Have I, is there anyone who hasn't followed that so far? I will spend a bit more time on this. Please, please say something. If you can't follow, please stop me. Just put your hand up or just say something. Okay. Uh, just a quick question on this. So the definition of risk, is it very different from the def definition of hazard? Very good question. The definition of hazard in the risk management standard is a source of risk a source of risk. So it could be a cause of a risk. So for example, human error, human factors, human error is a hazard. So particularly in an airline, we have to understand that people make mistakes. So that is a hazard. Humans are, infall are not infallible. They can make mistakes. So that is a hazard that we must manage. It creates a risk. So if the, the error is made in finance department, it creates a financial risk. If it's made in a tax department, it may create a liability risk or a legal risk. Um, if it's made in the flight deck, it clearly creates an operational risk. But the hazard in each of those examples is human error. Does that make sense? So is hazard always human error? Mm, no, sorry. Human error is an example of a hazard. Example. The power cable snaking across the floor of a classroom, if you have one, is a hazard. You could trip over it. It creates a safety risk to the people in the room. So the wire is a trip hazard. It's a source of risk. So that's a very simple example. Human error is probably a more complicated example. Um, 
electricity is a hazard because if you don't wire the, the building correctly, it could create, could electrocute someone or start a fire. So electricity is a hazard. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a source of risk, yeah. The level of risk is depending on how well the building has been built, how well the electrician wired the building, how well you have, how tidy the classroom is. Um, that's a mitigation, tidy classroom yeah. for the trip. Okay. So I just explore this. So we've said risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And it's a, effectively a change from what we expect. We expect, um, trying to think of a good example. We expect to load the aircraft without damaging the aircraft. If you damage the aircraft, the hazard is the equipment, damage the aircraft is the risk. But we don't expect to damage the aircraft. But what is expected, um, so if you're in business, for example, you expect to make I don't know, $100 million, but you actually make more because you've had a good year recovery from pandemic is better than expected, for example, then the airline makes more money. And so there is uncertainty on how much money the airline will make, and it could make more money than expected. So formally speaking, risk can be positive or negative. This is quite a complex concept. Most of the time we are interested in negative risk. But some people are interested in upside risk. This is a point I made just now. Objectives can have different aspects, financial, health and safety, environmental, and may apply at different levels. It could be a strategic risk, affecting the whole airline or the whole of engineering, for example. Organizational wide, affecting everyone, like the pandemic has, obviously. It could just affect a project, the intention to build a new hangar, for example. It may be late, or it's not quite what was needed. A product or a process, for example. So a process may be to make the maintenance, a B check more efficient, a B check on aircraft more efficient. So that would be a process. And it's possible that the changes do not make the check more efficient. So there's risk to that process. So it's really important to understand what we mean by risk and how we're measuring it and at what level are we talking? Risk, I should remark these words, this is a, a direct quote from the standard. Risk is often characterized by reference to potential events and consequence or combination of these. So we often talk about risk, we could lose a certain amount of money, we could lose $10,000, or we could injure someone, or we could have an oil spill. So that's different ways, different potential events. And the consequence could be contaminated water, for example, the oil spill, or it could be a person off work for a period of time, consequence. And it's the potential for these to happen, a possibility that they could occur. The 
but we often combine that with a likelihood, a likelihood of that happening. It is very likely that someone will be injured. It is unlikely someone will be injured. It is possible we may lose money. Uh, it is possible there will be an earthquake. We don't expect. So we can use all sorts of different words and engineers will sometimes also try and put numbers, not just engineers, financial people as well. There is a 10% chance of a project not being successful. Or there is a 20% chance we will have a delay. So again, it's really important to know what context, what type of risk we're talking, how we're going to measure it. Is it in terms of consequence? Or are we actually interested in how likely a consequence is? So this is probably sounding a little complex for a lot of people just for a moment, but as we work our way through, we'll explore examples of this and how we can formally and consistently consider risk, both as consequence, how bad or good it could be, and how likely that is to occur. I should remark that when the standard was being written, quite a few people said, this is too complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is less complicated than some of the early drafts. Um, and in the end, it was felt it was useful to write these four notes down against the definition of risk. So as we work through, hopefully this will become clearer. Okay. The next slide, we'll go back to what we mean by objectives. Objective, essentially we mean it's what we are trying to do. A thing aimed at or sought, a goal. Our goal is to start the new process. Our goal is to start a new route. Our goal is to improve the profitability of a route. Our goal is to introduce a new aircraft. Our goal is to complete this maintenance task on time. All sorts of goals. Our goal is to ensure there is no security breach this year. Our goal is to improve our customer experience. An airline is full of goals. All sorts of departments, all sorts of projects, all having goals, objectives. Um, and so with each goal comes risk. There's a possibility that the goal will not be met. So. Again, it's really un important in an airline in particular, not just an airline, but I think an airline is a really good example where so much going on in the, in the business, so many things happening that could go really, really well, or maybe will not go as expected. And a failure in one department or to meet a deadline or a time frame will affect other departments. So risk is can spread across the business. But it's always important to think what is the objective and therefore what it is we are trying to ensure will happen. Risk is about success, being successful, understanding what will stop you being successful and making sure you are successful. <laughs> Okay, and uh, I'm going to give an example sh shortly. Do we? How long do we have to the break? Uh, ten minutes. 
10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the other word that I said was important was this uncertainty. Uh, refers to situations involving imperfect or unknown information. This is one definition of uncertainty. Um, I like to think more it's the fact that we don't really cannot predict the future. We're going to only have a level of confidence of what will happen. <coughs> but why can we not be certain of a future? Maybe because we don't have enough information. We haven't got enough data. Uh, we haven't asked all the people involved. Uh, we're not sure how another organization will respond, a competitor, for example. We don't know the political strategic environment. There's uncertainty and concern with the uh, superpower dynamics at the moment, which clearly affects your part of the world. Um, and so there is bound to be uncertainty. Some of it we can address by doing more research, collecting more data, but some of it is just part of the world, the context. We cannot be sure how the pandemic will unfold. How will the US-China relationship change over time? Um, and that's just two very simple, but very important examples at the moment. Um, yeah, so uncertainty is part of life, um, but we can address some uncertainty by doing more research, for example, or another uncertainty is we just have to accept that we cannot know. And there's a very famous saying by what was his name? Donald Rumsfeld, the American <laughs> politician. Um, known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, you may recall. Um, sadly, uh, you don't know whether to be serious when you quote him because <laughs> but sadly his, his unknown unknowns cost a lot of harm and, in the world, but there we go. Um, what he meant was, there's some stuff we know we don't know. There's some stuff we know, and there's some stuff we don't know we don't know. Um, but that's uncertainty. That's the future. OK, um, just looking at the time now. Yeah, OK. I'm going to give you an example now, which is just, it was an example I was in, I was privileged to be involved in. It was an excellent project, airline project. Um, and I think I'll do spend the time before the break just setting the scene and then leave you all with a question to think about over the break before we start again. Okay, this is, a, like I say, an example from my own experience. It was um, 2008, global financial crisis. So a really uncertain time for airlines. And Air New Zealand was about to introduce the 777-300 extended range aircraft. But so a very significant investment, a new fleet. I can't remember, I think it was seven aircraft from memory. And yet the financial crisis was just starting. The airline wanted to spend 300 million US. It wanted to introduce not just a new aircraft, but three new seat types, premier economy, business class seats, and a new economy seat. 
And anyone in the certification part of the airline will understand that's complicated. These were brand new seats. They weren't, no one else had them. So each seat type had to be certificated in the aircraft uh, and done. So it's just another example of that it was a premier economy. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, that was the economy seat, but cuddle class it was nicknamed. Um, and so they wanted to introduce new aircraft, three new seat types, all constructed in various parts of the world and do it in two years. And yet there was a global financial crisis. So I was asked to help with the risk management of a project. So the question before we head into the break is what do you think we defined or how do you think we defined the objective for this project? So just to recap, new aircraft type, three new seat types, global financial crisis. And at the time, most airlines losing money. At one point, we were the only airline that made some money one year. Um, yeah, so perhaps if we could go into break now and um, if you could think about, we had one objective. We defined one objective for this project. And every risk in the project was measured against this one objective. Because we felt that it was easy to have 20 objectives. But that wasn't helpful because we needed to understand the risk in this project. We wanted it to be successful. We wanted to spend $300 million and it be a successful project, i.e. we would make a profit in time. So, yeah, it's half past now. Uh, if you could think about it and perhaps some people, I'm sure there's people out there prepared to say something. Think of what you think the, the overall objective was for this project. Okay. Okay. Tien? Yes. I think, yes, we will think about the objective and yes, we will share with you after the break. So we will take 15 minutes break. Um, so we'll see you in 10.45 our time. Is that okay? Okay. See you in 15 minutes, everyone. Idea or, or a service idea. And we'd simply look at the door and say, will that wow the customer? No. Okay. We'll put that idea aside. Will that risk impact wowing the customer? Yes. Okay. So we're interested in that risk. Everything was focused on this very one, simple one objective. Um, very powerful idea. Uh, I wouldn't have come up with it myself, but it worked very, very well. And when we measured risk, we had a very simple risk management system. We kept it simple, uh, but everything was, would it impact this objective? Um, and you could have arguments, well, what about safety? What about budget? But the point is, it wouldn't wear a customer if it wasn't delivered on time. It wouldn't be buying a customer if there's no aircraft. It won't be wearing a customer if it's not certified. Um, so everything could be simplified down to wear a customer. And as a result, we measured every risk against this. And the project was actually a very great success. Um, the aircraft was ready on time. The seats were ready on time, just. Um, and the airline actually made quite a significant um, boost in profits from this project. And interestingly, 
one of the reasons for success is that almost every other line in airline in the world had stopped spending money because of a financial crisis. And so when the financial crisis sort of came to an end, everyone was effectively on a back foot. They weren't ready. They didn't have a new product. They didn't have new aircraft. Um, Air New Zealand did. And so that was part of a reason for being successful. And I think it's a great example of a company board in this case, being prepared to take risk. All of the advice, the business advice of the time globally was cut costs, cut costs. And yet when this project was put up to the airline board, they said, yep, yeah, we're gonna spend $300 million despite the uncertainty because we'd spend time looking at what the future was gonna look like in two years time, what is the future gonna look like? And what they considered was the world will have recovered or will be recovering. People will be prepared to travel. The market will have recovered. So we're gonna take the risk. So I personally think it's a very, very good example um, of being very clear on objectives, being confident that's the right objective, and then having a program to identify anything that would stop you achieving that objective so that we could put in mitigations, put in corrections, put in alternative solutions to ensure success. Applied risk management. Okay, is uh, anyone would like to add something? Like I say, so these example uh, objectives that were put up were really good and were actually surprisingly close, I think, to, to what we had, where we're a customer, a high quality service, a sellable product, um, a new experience, but very close to this point. The only difference is we kept it really simple, <laughs> I suppose, a very simple statement. Hmm. Is there any difficulties uh, when you, you know, running the project mm -hmm. for this one and another? Sorry, I'm not hearing that. Is there any difficulties or drawbacks or maybe unfinished things for the project? Were there any drawbacks? Was there anything not finished? Um, no, it was. Um, it was actually yes. No, actually, I'm not quite correct there. The product development um, did not work particularly well, and what happened there was the idea was to have a roll-in meal service. You could ask for a meal at any time. You could even ask for toast. Boeing were not very happy with the idea of a toaster on, a, on an aircraft, but uh, we had toasters. Um, what actually didn't work in the end particularly well was the customer wasn't educated that they could have a meal at any time, uh, that they could order unusual foods. And so the demand didn't really pick up for that part of a project, for that part of a product. Um, I would say that was the one thing that didn't quite go very well. Mm. Yeah. But overall, um, I think most people would say it was a very successful project. And the general manager who was responsible for the project went on to become the CEO of Airways New Zealand, which is the service provider, the navigation service provider, air traffic control, and is now the CEO of a Canadian airline. <laughs> so he, he was just, he's clearly the sort of person who's prepared to take risk, to try new things. Yes, you may not be 100% successful, but you learn on the way 
and you grow on, on along the way. Mm. His name is Ed Sims, if anyone would like to look him up. E-D, Ed, and Sims, S-I-M-M-S, -S, Ed Sims. A Welshman, like me. <laughs> okay. Your experience is flight, if you fly to New Zealand? Um, the business premier seat has been taken out, but the business, sorry, no, not correct. The business premier seat is still there. The economy premier seat has been taken out. Mm. But the cuddle class still exists, yes. Mm. But you can't have toast anymore, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we try to remember. No. <laughs> And New Zealand does not have a first class. We just have business okay. premier. Mm. Okay, a very good question. Thank you for that question. That's very relevant. Mm. I, I have some question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell how you did work management of that time? What are the steps to do and what the different from work management now? Mm. Very good question. The the method we used is the method in the international standard, ISO 31000. Uh, that standard hasn't really changed since it was first published in 2009. Um, and I think that really reflects it is, it's a very effective process it puts in place. Um, the, we applied it in a very simple way. We did not become complicated. We had a very simple database. Every um, program manager had to identify risk, which was my role was to help them do that. And then every week, I think it was, they had to update their risks. And the administration person, she would make sure everyone had constantly just monitoring how the risks were going. So if any risk was showing as high at the project meeting each week, everyone would discuss the high risks and help everyone else to manage the risks. So everyone could see what we call the risk profile of a project um, and understand the decisions they made, what effect it would have on other people, other departments. So we kept it simple, but we also kept it um, relevant, um, current. It was part of yeah. each week's project plan. What are the risks looking like? How can we reduce risk? What are the risks we are concerned about? Um, yeah. But it's the same process as I'll be introducing shortly. That useful. Okay. So the next slide, I was going to ask. Um, oh, we've done. I'll come move straight on. Okay. That was an example of a project um, introduce a new aircraft a new product, a new seat types. But in an airline, there are, there's activity all the time, as we've said before. So in each, in the airline, there are different objectives across the airline. At its most fundamental, most basic, an airline's objective is to fly customers from one airport to another, from one location to another. And I'm sure we'd all agree on that. Another fundamental objective of an airline, I would suggest, is to be sustainable, to survive, to be here next year. 
and of course to be safe. If an airline is not safe, does not safely carry passengers, it will not be sustainable. Um, and there's many examples of airlines that have not survived. Um, I think in Europe in particular. Um, and some major names have disappeared through history. They weren't sustainable for some reason. Uh, but fundamentally, to carry passengers, be a sustainable business, and, above, and do that safely. That's my core, I would suggest, an airline is. And that although in each of your departments, you may have different objectives, complete a maintenance schedule on time, load the aircraft correctly, move a cargo from here to there, do not damage a cargo, be pleasant to the customers, hope the customers will come back, all sorts of objectives. Ultimately, they all support moving people from one location to another, a sustainable business that is safe. So each department is ultimately su supporting these objectives. There may be strategic objectives imposed, of course. It could be to grow the airline, to um, increase route structure, to increase profitability international. Then from time to time, the senior team will be refining the objective but we'll never move away from these fundamental objectives. And whatever you do in your departments, your objectives are absolutely correct, but ultimately support this one objective. Or oh, sorry, these two objectives. So the reason I've raised in this is that when we, later on, when we consider how we're measuring risk, we need to recognize that while we could measure risk against the, our own objectives, we must also, if we're going to report risk up into the organization, we need to be able to measure it against the organizational objectives. Okay. And one way to look at what the objectives in each department is or are is to consider the customer journey through an airline. And what I mean by that. When I talk about a customer journey, I'm not talking about flying from one location to another. I'm talking about the way the customer interacts or the airline interacts with the customers. And the first step is sales and bookings. When the customer thinks, I need to travel, how shall I travel? The airline is offering a solution. And you want to capture as many of those people as possible. You've got to then make it easy for them to check in. And when they check in, all the information is correct. And then the load information is correct for the aircraft. And the passengers have had right luggage limitations, etc. They turn up on time. The gate opens on time. The aircraft is loaded within time. And the pushback occurs on time. The aircraft is ready. The minimum equipment list is correct. The crews are qualified. There's a lot going on. But ultimately, you're supporting this customer journey through how the airline interacts with its customers. And then they are safely disembarked. And hopefully they'll come back the next time because they've had a great experience. So that's what I mean by the customer journey in the airline. 
every part of the airline interacts with a customer in a different way. And therefore your objectives at these different points is, is different and yet they're all supporting the same objective. Safe, sustainable airline that moves people and they come back to fly again. So, um, and you want to go any comments there? One way to look at it. This is quite simple, of course. There's a lot of other people you never often get forgotten. The engineers fixing the airplanes, the baggage handlers, the people packaging cargo, you name it. There's, there's so many people, the flight planners, the weather, um, performance engineers, you name it. There are thousands of people all making this happen. And it's easy to forget all these people in the background. But ultimately their objectives are all the same is to support a sustainable, safe airline that moves people safely from, from where they want to where they want to go. And then they come back for more retainment. So when we talk about risk and we talk about objectives, we remember that we've got our own objectives, but ultimately the airline has high level objectives. Okay. Now we're gonna move into um, the theory of risk management. So the, I suppose the important thing just to take away from this first part is risk is about meeting objectives. If we can sum, sum up all the previous slides, risk is about meeting objectives, about being successful. Okay. So this is a recap. I've already mentioned that there's an international standard on risk management, ISO 31000. I call it a new global risk management standard. It's now the established risk management standard, no question. And although I'm not on the committee that writes these standards anymore, I am still aware of what is going on and there's to date, there's been no suggestion of change in the standard. Um, the last change in the standard from the 2009 version to the 2018 version was tiny little changes, very small. Uh, a new diagram, sort of slightly different words, but fundamentally, it hasn't changed. And I, I'm not aware of any intention that it will change. The intention of this standard was to be like the top document, the overall document, not necessarily the only document on risk management. Uh, but the idea is that all risk management standards and guides all fit, all agree with this one. So there is another document called Guide 73, which has all the terminology, all the words correct words to use in risk. So for example, the question asked earlier about hazard, if you look in guide 73, indeed, if you look in ISO 31000 as well, it will define exactly what hazard means. Um, this will define what probability means, what consequence means, for example. Um, so we can all use the same words, um, whether you're an engineer, financier, insurance, it doesn't matter, safety person, quality person, you can all use the same words. So the oil industry uses the same words, for example. Um, the standard has, as I've mentioned briefly before, it sets out the principles of risk management a framework to ensure that it is carried out and the process, the fundamental process of how you do it. 
and all of these um, are apply can be applied to any sector. So, for example, into um, IT security standard follows the same principles. Um, engineer independency, engineer and analysis follows the same principles. And safety management systems, say a KO, are very close to it. People are slowly evolving to be in line with this standard. Some words slightly different, but <coughs> there is general agreement that everyone should be doing it the same. And this is the standard that, that is the lead standard. Okay, so we'll now talk about that standard. Um, it's a very short standard, it's not very thick, it's about 20 pages. Um, and everything in it can be summed up in one diagram. And this is the diagram in the standard. Uh, and I, touched, I showed you a small image of this diagram earlier. It sets out the principles of risk management principles and it lists them. It sets out a framework for how to ensure risk management is carried out in your organization. And it shows you how to carry out a risk assessment or risk management process. And that's it. So unlike some big international standards, which are very complicated and you can spend your whole life specializing in them. This one is very simple, which is one of the reasons I particularly like it. It suggests that the authors really understood their subject. So I'll start by um, going through the principles. There's a total of um, 10, uh, I used to say 11, but they've combined two. The core objective of risk management, the core principle is it must help create value and protect value, help value creation and protection. The whole point of risk management is to protect existing value and to help grow value within an organization. The standard uses the word organization instead of business because it can be applied to a commercial business, a government department, a charity, almost any, any business, any organization, a school, doesn't matter. They can all apply this standard. So this is ultimately what risk management is about. Now, these eight uh, principles listed around the side are all important. And I'll step through each one in turn. The first is that to be effective, to be useful, risk management process must be integrated into a business into the organization. To be effective, it mustn't be something that you do afterwards or you do separately. When you make a decision, you should be considering risk at the same time. There is no point, for example, writing a business case, putting your business case up, and then thinking about the risks associated with that business case. You should prepare your business case and understand the risks, assess the risks of your business case at the same time. It's part of a process. We will open a new route. What are the risks with that new route? We will buy a new aircraft type. What are the risks associated with buying a new aircraft type? We will transition pilots between a fleet. 
what are the risks we do in that transition? There's so many decisions in an airline that have been made all the time. We'll introduce a new screening method, you name it. So many decisions. There's no point considering the risk afterwards. You should be considering the risk as you make the decision. So that's what's meant by integrated. It's part of just the way that we do, do things. That isn't to say that you can't review risk. And I think a safety department is a good example where you're constantly re-evaluating risk. But the safety department is integral to the airline. It's part of the airline, for example. So it's part of what we do. Structured, so the next principle. Sorry, before I move on, any questions on that one? Um, if you've got some questions you might be thinking or answer, just write notes, we can talk about them later or maybe on the chat later on. Be happy to. The next principle is structured and comprehensive. What that means is we have a set way of doing it. We do it in a structured way. We don't just think, ah, oh, I've just identified a risk. Let's sort that one out and then carry on and do something else. We consistently identify, assess, mitigate, review. Identify, assess, review. It's a structured thing. Every time we make a decision, we will consider risk. And also that we must do it in everything that we do, comprehensive. It mustn't just be, I just thought of a risk, let's sort that one out, and then forget about all the others. A systematic way of doing business, which is how airlines operate anyway. We're systematic people. We have to be. Otherwise, no aircraft would take off on time. So that shouldn't be difficult for an airline. Now, the next principle is interesting. Um, customized. What that means is there is no one way of doing risk management. Um, the way we measure risk in one department isn't necessarily exactly the way we do it in another department. The way that a textbook tells us to do risk in a business need not be the way that best suits the cargo department, for example, or the airport. The people are different. The pace of activity is different. The subject is different. Uh, the types of risk are different. So we should customize the way we do it to suit that part of a business. Say how frequently we view risk may be different in different parts of a business. Um, do we collect a team together to talk about risk or do we have specialists doing risk? Depends how complicated it is. So each area of business may have a slightly different way of doing it. So if that is correct, it should be customized to your business, your department, your airline, et cetera. Okay, and that might explain if someone's concerned that they want to do risk in a slightly different way to save a safety department, that's fine, provided it's logical and suitable for your department. It does, doesn't mean that you necessarily report risk differently because if you're reporting risk, people have to understand it. But the frequency, exactly how you identify risk can be suit your own department. The next principle is inclusive. This is actually quite an interesting and important one. What that means is you must involve everyone who may have something to contribute, some information, or may be affected by risk. You include people. There's a, a risk in the risk process of not identifying all risks, for example, or misunderstanding the 
consequences. And one way to protect against that is to include people. To have a sit down quietly and just write out a load of risks, a set of risks is, is risky because you may have forgotten something. If you ask about, have a workshop, include people, maybe from other departments, other disciplines, you're more likely to be successful in identifying and assessing risk. So inclusive is a principle. Okay, can I suggest at this point that some of what I'm saying now might be worth writing some notes for the questions and answers afterwards. <laughs> okay, so pay attention. <laughs> okay, uh, next principle is dynamic. Now, this is a really interesting one as well. Um, what it means is things change. Some organizations, some departments, things are moving very quickly. Change is happening all the time. And so risk has to be assessed at the same pace. Um, a phrase that's now used in some business circles is the rhythm of the business. What they mean is the pace at which decisions are made. Some are infrequent, slow, very steady parts of a business, nothing changes much. So they can do risk management less often, but some parts are changing very quickly or their environment is changing very quickly. And so you have to move at the same pace. Risks might have changed very quickly. So you need a system that can keep up with that. And also the rate of change may change over time. So for example, now with a pandemic, clearly we've all gone through significant changes in the way we work, our environment, our lives, how we communicate. So the risk profile, types of risk we're facing is changing. And it will continue to change as we come out of a pandemic. A good example would be currency, how familiar people are with their roles. If you, if a pilot hasn't flown a particular aircraft, um, how are they, are they current on a simulator? Have you got new people um, operate working around the aircraft? Are they familiar? Is it a different type of aircraft? Are they familiar with the pace of work? Or have they got slow? Have they got comfortable? at a low pace. These are all changes that are occurring now. Um, and so risk is changing quickly as well. So we need to be conscious of that and maybe do more risk assessment more quickly, do quick ones, and then find where we should be concentrating. So that's what we mean dynamic. The world is dynamic and we need to be working at the same pace. The next principle says best available information. What that means is we should use the best available information we can hold. So do the research, ask questions, ask people, read the industry press, um, keep up to date with what's happening in other airlines, for example, all sorts of different ways that we can get a really good picture so we can identify risk and assess risk correctly. If we don't identify a risk, we can't manage it. So that's really important. And always being aware of what's going on and seeking information is really important. So use the best available information. The next principle, this is a really interesting one. Um, and I think one that applies to airlines in particular is take human and cultural factors into account. So what that means is be aware about the human condition that we all behave differently, think differently, have different backgrounds, 
cabin crews are different to engineers. Marketing people are different to quality people. Um, I'm carefully picking opposites. We, we think differently. We uh, have a different perception of a world, a different perception of risk. So we need to be aware of that. Um, and so when, for example, we're being inclusive, it may be worth thinking, well, who can we get who's different to ourselves, who may have a different view? Also, being an airline, flying to have different countries, be aware that the culture of, say, the ground handlers may be different in a different location to your own. Um, we can think of many nationalities are very different to each other. Um, some may casual, some may rigid, uh, some may stern, some may relaxed. We need to be aware of that. Uh, things happen differently in different locations. And the same happens in a business, in the organization. Different types of people behave in different ways. So we need to think about that. There is a, sometimes I say, if there is no people, there is no risk. And that works partly because you, can, you can't hurt anyone if it's not there, but also they behave differently. If we all were robots, it would be easy. We're not. And the last principle, continual improvement. So always try and do it better the next time. Learn from the last time you did a risk assessment. Uh, even use risk as part of a continuous improvement program, for example. How do we reduce risk? Can we take more risk? Um, so continuous process, doing it better every time. Or oh, we missed the risk last time. How do we make sure we don't miss them in the future? So they are the principles of risk management as set out in the international standard on risk management. I personally find them really useful and I frequently re, um, refer to them uh, when I'm doing assignments for companies and clients. Any comments anyone would like to add? Is there a principle that you think is missing or is there one that surprises you or perhaps some that you'd like me to explain again? Just a quick question, I, uh, just a curious. So in the earlier slides, you talk about the sustainable business and I'm looking here at the value creation and protections. Um, is there any like environmental factor in here? Because as I know, sustainable sustainability does involve environment. And it's very, not very, mentioned very, here. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, and thank you for raising it. It's a little like the word safety isn't here either. The to be safe is an objective. To meet environmental laws or to meet any law would be an objective. To be environmentally, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Responsible could be an objective. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very much. You're quite right. Uh, sustainable is often used to mean. Uh, environmentally sustainable. Um, and absolutely, we should be uh, aiming to meet all environmental objectives. So they may be set out by the company. It may be set out as a, a policy. Uh, there'll be laws about environmental impact as well. And also increasingly public expectations on environment. So meeting public expectations, whether that's the global public or the national public, is part of it would you could say is an objective. Uh, we will be covering <laughs> um, environment um, later. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I, I and I should have perhaps mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Mm. It's going to be increasing pressure on all airlines now as to how to improve the environmental impact how to reduce carbon dioxide, how to improve efficiency of aircraft. Um, yeah, very, very important how to 
find solutions for the climate crisis. Yeah, very important. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly, I think a lot of businesses, uh, sorry, a lot of airlines, um, certainly in Europe, are having to face with the public are deciding to use the train instead of the airline. Because the train service is so good, why would I want to fly and have a large carbon footprint when I can use a train have a low carbon footprint? So that is a certainly for, like say, some European airlines, that's a risk to their business. And how do they respond? They've been pushed to think about electric aircraft, has been pushed to think about more efficient aircraft. Um, absolutely, very important subject. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Okay, any other comments? Like I say, worth, worth taking notes occasionally. <laughs> they may be asked. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just let me just check. I've got the right slides here. So I've talked about, probably covered this a little bit, applying the principles. The principles apply across the airline, um, be a dynamic, suitable for the pace of a part of a business, include the right people, uh, et cetera. All apply in different parts of the airline in different ways. So when you think about your own department, you need to be thinking, how do I integrate a risk management process that we will do later into my department, into the way we work? How do I make it structured and comprehensive? How do I customize it for my department? How do I include people in the process? How frequently do we have to revisit, reconsider risk? And all risks or just some risks? Not just what's happening within your department, what's happening around us, the world around us. How do I obtain the best information? What research do we have to do? Are there other departments or other airlines in the same, with the same problems or the same environment? What are they doing? understand who is having problems what problems are people having are there any cultural factors or human factors that we need to consider in our risk assessments and how do i improve a process for next time so these are the questions you need to be thinking about for your own part of a business or if the parts of a business and they already have very structured risk management processes, the question may be, is it fully integrated? Could we do it in a more structured way? Could we improve it slightly? Could we refine it? Are we including everyone? Are we doing it frequently enough? So these are the sorts of questions, uh, whether you've already got a risk management process or whether you're building them, that you need to ask. And that's why I personally think these principles are so useful, so valuable, because it's a good test to ask yourself. Boom, boom, boom. Um, the original standards before the international standard, like the Australian New Zealand one, were very similar, but it did, they didn't include these principles. So I think the committee the five years spent by the committee writing the standard was very valuable in part because I think it was the Australian representative from memory said, hang on, we need some principles. And we spent two years talking about principles and, um, and came up with these. Okay, any more questions before we move on to the framework? Nope. 
Okay. So this is that diagram again. We've got we've talked about the principles. We want the circle on the top. We're now going to talk about the framework. So what this means is how do we make sure that risk management is done in the airline or in the group? And how do we make sure it's done well? I'll tell a story of uh, my own experience. When I was recruited to join Air New Zealand, the first task my vice president or set out for me, he said, your task is to make sure everyone in, in the airline does risk management, does it well. And at the time, the standard only had this. It didn't have principles and it didn't have framework. No one had thought about these before. So I set off and I thought, this will be easy. There's plenty of clever people in this airline. We'll have no problem teaching people this risk process and I'm sure they'll do it. And so, yes, I went around lecturing people and explaining and helping to set up risk management processes, formal processes. Six months later, I sort of went back to engineering, for example, and said, how's it going? And they say, how's what going? The risk process you're meant to be doing. Oh, we've forgotten to do that. <laughs> I'm simplifying. But what it was really interesting that people understood what they had to do, but it wasn't being done. And I think what was missing was we didn't have a framework. We didn't have this piece, which was firstly, at a very senior level, commitment that the whole of the organization will do risk management well, and will do it in a modern way, a contemporary way. There was no senior vice president, for example, assigned to make sure that risk management would be done by the whole business. So there I am at a manager level trying to do this, but we were missing this, a clarity of expectations that all departments will formally assess and manage risk. And as a result, we didn't have a implementation plan to make sure everyone's done. We weren't, didn't have a way of evaluating how well it was being done. And therefore we didn't have a way to formally improve the way we did it. We hadn't made sure that was integrated into a business. And did we have a design that worked for the whole business? Not sure. So this piece isn't obvious what it does until you don't have it. Um, until there's a commitment to do it in each department and do it across the group, it'll be inconsistent. There'll be some parts fully understand it, but I'll do it anyway. Safety would be an example. But others, unless, you know, people change, managers change and it won't continue. This is a way of making sure it is done consistently and correctly by all departments. And also some indication of how much resource should go into it. You could spend a lot of resource, perhaps too much. So this leadership is to say, we want to see this. We want to see every business case has a risk assessment, for example. We want to have a report on risk every quarter, or every six months. The clarity of what the expectation is. So that's the risk framework. Um, by chance, I'm just doing some work with a, a client at the moment. It's a large state-owned enterprise. So it's owned by the government. It's not an airline. 
but this is exactly what they're trying to build at the moment um, because they're in a dynamic environment information technology field they know the world is changing very fast so they want to make sure they're going to manage risk well and so they have asked us to help design a framework so it's not just airlines anyone any company organization that is in a dynamic environment is facing a lot of risk and so increasingly companies are, are designing these frameworks to make sure that the whole of their business carries out risk management correctly um, and consistently and at the correct level not too detailed not too light and so there'll be a policy written the ceo will commit to this the board will be asking for reports for example Any questions on that? Um, so for this framework, who should design this? Is this a, like a top-down approach? Like the top management should design this? Is that correct? Ideally, they may seek advice on how to do it, but ideally it should come down as a requirement. Yes, yeah. Um, I understand there's a focus group on risk uh, in February, is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So that would be where this sort of thing should be um, discussed and ideally set in place. Yeah. Because I see some of it, for example, like evaluation, it can be, I guess it's top down, but it can be evaluated from the bottom up, I guess, also. Uh, yes, um, there's no reason that a department or a part of a business couldn't carry on and carry on and do risk management. It's just for it to be sustainable in the long term and consistent across the whole of a business, of the whole of a group, this is what's needed. Clarity of requirements, yeah. But it's nothing to stop anyone, any department pressing up and doing a really good job at risk management. Absolutely. Mm. This is just to make sure it's it, it's sustainable, it's consistent, uh, and it's appropriate across the whole group. Mm. You may find that a department has produces a really good example of how it can be done, and that could inform the design and say, well, we want everyone to do it the same way as this department, for example. Okay, any of questions? Is everyone keeping up? Am I still being clear? All good. Take silence is okay. <laughs> I think silence is okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, um, so the next part is Shall we say the business end? Whoops. Oh, this is just a recap. Leadership commitment is about integration, design, implementation, evaluation. That is, sorry, I should explain evaluation of how well risk management is being done. Uh, that doesn't mean evaluating risk, it means how well are we doing risk management and how do we improve it? Okay. A risk process. This is what most people think about risk management. This is the doing part of risk management, so we say. Um, <coughs> okay, and um, some of you may have seen a slightly different version of this diagram. This is the newer version. The old one was just boxes set out, but it's exactly the same. Um, so again, it'll be useful for people to maybe take notes, hint, hint. 
Okay. Um, the risk management process starts with this box here, understanding the scope, context, and criteria. This is a piece, sorry, when I told that story of how I'd been a nuclear engineer, I'd been taught about risk, and when I picked up the New Zealand standard, Australian New Zealand standard on risk, and I was really impressed, and this is why I was impressed. They would added this step. This step is a key of how you make sure that any organization, any department, any project can do the process well. The first bit is scope. What are we actually interested in? What is the scope of our risk assessment? Because you don't want it to be too big that you spend a lot of time identifying risks that really have of no consequence to you. Conversely, you want to include everything that's important. So it's important to just spend a bit of time thinking, what are we interested in and we're not interested in? What are we going to assess risk on? The next bit is context. Context really means what is in our, what is our environment? What is our work environment? What is um, the situation we are in? before we start our risk process. And the pandemic at the moment is context. If you carried out a risk assessment, I don't know, three years ago, the context would have been different to a risk assessment today. The difference is the pandemic, the health situation, the stress on the business, the downturn in activity and travel, um, the mental health on all the, everyone. Um, that's all part of a context. People um, taking time out, etc. It's all part of understanding the environment in which the risks we're going to explore, identify and explore, are happening. Are people at the top of their game? Are, have people got different things on their mind, which is, are people stressed? Are passengers going to come back? Etc. So, so many things have changed. Um, that is the context in which we're going to identify and assess risk. So it's really important to understand that context. And then my last point here is criteria. What that means is how are we going to assess risk? What are we going to assess risk against? Have we got laws that we've got to meet? Have we got requirements, regulations? Um, what is the acceptable level of risk? What level of risk have we previously accepted? Has something changed? in people's acceptance of risk, for example. So that's criteria. So the very first part of a risk process has got nothing to do with identifying risk. It's about knowing where you're starting. It's about starting in the right place. Understanding the size of a risk assessment you're about to understand or undertake. Understanding the environment in which all these risks occur and understanding what you're going to measure against. So that was what was new in this thinking and is in the international standard. Before you start doing a risk assessment, understand this. Because this is really important. Yeah. We will do an exercise later, which will Help, help you understand this piece, I think. Um, have we got any questions on that one? No? Okay. And like I say, we'll come back to it because it's not obvious what that means, but it is really important. 
we then start the risk assessment process. And the first thing we must do is identify risk. You can't manage a risk uh, if you haven't identified it. So actually, this not only is this a very important step, it's actually a very difficult step um, because you don't know, to use Rumfeld's case, you don't know what you don't know. So you've got to come up with ways of identifying risk. Um, and that's actually a hard one, a hard bit. Um, there's a very famous, quite famous story from the Apollo program, uh, the American Apollo program. Um, mm -hmm. If any of you know the history there, you'll know that they lost a crew on Apollo 1. Three astronauts were killed uh, on the launch pad. Um, by any measure, it was a hugely successful program, but they did lose one crew, and it was Apollo 1. Um, that's where a fire broke out in the capsule. Um, on the launch pad and the crew couldn't get out in time. Uh, a lot of things had gone wrong. Because they'd used pure oxygen in the capsule, um, the fire spread very, very quickly. They'd used a lot of plastics, Velcro, so there was a lot to burn. And the capsules, um, hatch was bolted shut. So it took a very long time to open it. So a number of things, decisions had been made um, without identifying fire in the capsule as the hazard. In the investigation afterwards, in the American, as they do it, they go to Congress and they big, big public uh, open debates about it. Um, one of the NASA engineers said, when asked why hadn't they identified it, they said, just hadn't crossed our minds. We just hadn't identified it as a risk. It seemed obvious afterwards, but they had so many decisions to make in the program. They missed this one. Uh, so that's a really good example of what happens when you don't identify a risk? You just don't see it happening. And with hindsight, you think, ah, oh, we should have seen that, but we didn't. So that process of identifying risk needs to be able to explore everything and try and find out what we haven't thought about. That's the hard bit. What haven't we thought about? Hmm. Anyway, I think someone was trying to say something there. Yes, uh, no. No, no, okay. Um, yeah, really interesting example, a sad example, obviously, because it was a hugely successful program otherwise. Um, but the honesty when that was said, but we just didn't think about it. We just didn't recognize the risk. Um, it's really important. Um, and there's many examples of, of where risks haven't been identified. Um, and as things become very complicated, it's easy to, easier to miss them. So we need ways of identifying risk. And one of the really useful ways to do it is consult, communicate and consult. Talk to people. Um, talk to other airlines, pass, um, involve other departments, ask about, has anyone explored this? Has anyone tried this before? Has anyone undertaken a similar project before? Um, interestingly, um, in my time at Air New Zealand, one thing I noticed was Jetstar, Qantas and Air New Zealand were free airlines fierce competitors, Qantas and Air New Zealand, they were after each of us throats all the time, trying to win the trans-Tasman routes. And yet, we'd all get together and we'd talk about safety together. We'd talk about 
required navigation performance together. We help each other identify risk. Uh, I've worked with workshops with all and Virgin in the room, all working together to identify risk, safety risks, because no one wants an accident. Um, and that's great because say Virgin would be flying a Boeing Jetstar and then he's in the flying Airbus. What is it in a Boeing that's done differently? Why is it done differently? Does that mean there's a risk we're not seeing? Really, really great conversations I had. Uh, if everyone's open and knows that we're trying to identify risks, mm -hmm. the throttles behave differently, whatever it is. Okay, does that mean we've got a risk that we haven't seen? Really, really great, great conversations at times. Um, another example was short, short and runway operations. Again, all the airlines, all in the room, all helping in Singapore with everyone, all were talking about the same problem. And together, you can identify risks because each airline or each group or each department is bringing different experience to the table. So finding ways of identifying risk um, is really important. That, that's the key. If you don't identify a risk, you can't manage it. Um, another great example, personal one that I'm aware of is where Air New Zealand were introducing the head-up display on the A320. It wasn't any, it wasn't half as good as the Boeing head-up display. So we got, uh, or the airline got a human factors expert from the UK out for three weeks. And he helped them work through the human factors of introducing a head-up display that wasn't particularly good. Um, really important. And because he had experiences from helicopters from the North Sea oil industry, you name it, he was able to help the airline's uh, working group identify risks. Once we identify risks, we could mitigate them. It's a really important step. If you do nothing else, at least have a list of risks. And at least everyone's worried about the same thing, shall we say, or um, worrying about something that needs to be worried about. Really important step, yeah. Okay, any questions on that? Any ideas, anyone got experience of identifying risk and perhaps unusual risks or risks that you didn't expect to see. Uh, it was a good one, but um, I think I mentioned earlier about Qantas have had an incident um, recovering from a pandemic, starting new flights. Um, they had an aircraft flying, uh, 787 flying from Sydney to Perth. Uh, it took off, couldn't retract its undercarriage. Dumped fuel came back to Sydney. So what had gone wrong? Why couldn't it retract its undercarriage? It's because two of the locking pins were still in place in the main carriage carriages. Why were the two pins left in place? And it's a, it's a frightening story, actually, because so many mistakes had been made. But it was really interesting. The, the aircraft was, was brought to the gate um, by a group of workers who had not, between them, had either not been in charge, the person in charge had never been in charge before. Two of the wing walkers had never been involved with a 787. The line engineer was not in charge, even though he was the most experienced. And the trainee engineer had only worked on A320. The whole range of things had changed. And it seems that the training had not caught up. So the whole team, everyone was new at what they were doing. And so when they were told to take pins out and put the pins in the storage, 
people assumed someone else had done that. Or oh, my ladder was too short, so they couldn't see the pins in the storage. So there's a whole bunch of stuff was happening. Um, but came down to the fact that because of a pandemic, people had changed their roles. People were now doing jobs that they really hadn't been trained for or working on an aircraft they hadn't previously worked on. And so all these mistakes were made. And then to compound it, a really interesting thing is the crew did a walk around and didn't see the pins with a remove before flight red tags hanging from them. And that seems to be in a comment. They'd never seen the pins before because they'd always been taken out before. So they didn't actually know what they were looking for. Um, and it was windy and wet, so the red tags got wrapped up and couldn't be seen. Whole series of things, really interesting study. And I think it just helps to illustrate, it's a good example of the context has changed. We're now moving hopefully to a post-pandemic world. People have changed roles. They're no longer now operating the same aircraft they were before. So mistakes creep in. Um, training maybe hasn't caught up. So the context has changed. So the risk picture has changed. And how do you identify those risks? One way is to say, other airlines have had a problem. Are we going to have the same problem? Qantas has had a problem. Are we going to have the same problem? really useful to keep an eye on what's happening in the industry. That's not the only example. There was um, a runway excursion. Uh, I've forgotten who it was now. Same sort of post-pandemic factors. Um, yeah, so a great way to identify risk is have a look at what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Really, really useful. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the benefits of aviation is we do talk, we do communicate about incidents. So there's other lessons can be learned from other people. But the important thing there is to identify the root cause, the real risk. Yes, the pins were left in, but why were the pins left in? Because people weren't quite trained on my job. Hmm. So immediately you can think, where else in the business have we had people change roles and maybe they haven't been fully trained? Let's identify risks there. So a really good example, I think that one is. Any comments? Anyone got other examples where perhaps risks have been identified new? Um, there is no example. I think um, it is lunch break here, so I would like to ask if we can just start for a quick lunch break and then we come back and maybe people will think about the risk that they have been. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I hadn't seen the time go by. I do apologize for cutting yeah, into people's no, no, no. lunch. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we would like to take usually um, this course take one hour and a half uh, minutes break. Uh, Yes, yeah, so we'll come back at like 140. Is that okay? okay? So it's leave you also enough time because dinner time for you, is that correct? Yep. yep okay. That's good for you. Yep. Yeah. Leave you enough time and leave us also enough time to go grab a quick lunch. Yeah. Okay. Time for me to have my dinner. <laughs> 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 um, and a good idea. Once you're having your lunch, think about uh, examples of identifying. New risks. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you shortly. Mọi người quay lại một giờ bốn khoảng một giờ bốn mươi ạ. Okay. Thank you very much. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Have caught up with your emails, WhatsApp, Signal. <laughs> Everything else, <laughs> <laughs> which is life today. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, um, welcome back everyone. Um, I'll start sharing my screen again. Yes, please. Uh, yes. All good? Yeah, all good. Right. Okay, everyone. Um, I'll just recap where we are, are at. Um, so we're working our way through the process of risk management uh, in the global standard, ISO 31000. And if you recall, um, I stepped through the principles of risk management, the circle here, We've talked fairly briefly on the framework, and now we're talking about a risk management process. And this will take in more time because this is where a rubber hits the road, where the real work is. Um, and if you recall, I spoke about scope, context, and criteria, understanding the scope of your work, the context, what's happening around you, rules, regulations, situation, um, criteria, are there any requirements on risk? And then I talked about risk identification process and how important that is that we can only identify, we can only manage a risk if we've identified it and how therefore this is a very important step um, and we start, I gave an example of where risk hadn't been identified and the value of consulting and researching to try and find risks, um, your unknown unknowns. Okay, so, um, and I gave some examples of some recent risks at Qantas incident, for example. Um, where uh, new risks that have appeared because of context have changed um, uh, with training, not keeping up with changes, for example. So our next step on the process is to analyze risk or risk analysis, which really in simpler terms means understand, understand risk. Um, analysis suggests very complicated mathematical processes, and they can be. You can use statistical analysis and very advanced mathematics in some circumstances. But for most of us, that's not necessary. All we are trying to do is understand the risks uh, that we've identified. And in particular, how what is their level? How much risk are we talking about? Is it just a small amount of risk or a large amount of risk? And therefore, what should we do about it? When we analyze risk, we're trying to identify what causes it, what affects it, what raises or lowers a risk. How does it relate to other risks? Um, and then finally, how high is that risk? What's this quantum? How big is it? And the next part of it, um, course, will be particularly looking at how to measure risk um, and how to analyze risk. Having identified risk, having now gone through a process of understanding the risk, and again, you may want to consult with people to help understand that risk. Experts in a particular field, for example, other stakeholders, others who've experienced similar risks. You then have to evaluate the risk. And what that means is decide if you have to do something about it. So if you recall, I, I talked about criteria in the first step. And that is largely trying to decide or find out was an acceptable level of risk. And in the evaluation step, you're comparing the risk you've identified and now understand and measured against your criteria. 
Now, again, this may be straightforward or it may not be. So some criteria imposed on us. We're told what the criteria are. And that might be the law. The law requires you to do such a thing. Um, health and safety is a, is a law all around the world that is evolving and changing to set criteria on safety. Um, in the aviation sector, we're fortunate to be very clear about safety. We really don't accept unsafe conditions. And the FAA and the KO and IATA all give us tools to help us understand and measure risk. They may not be um, tools that you have to use, but they're useful and they're very proven tools. So that gives us a lot of scope, certainly in the technical side of aviation, to be able to analyze and evaluate risk very rigorously, very well. Um, there's plenty of textbooks, lots of examples um, that we can turn to to use. And also in the technical parts of aviation, a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of statistics, a lot of records, uh, a lot of expert analysis that's been done for us. Um, so that makes these steps relatively simple. I got to say, relatively straightforward. If they were not complex risks, it would be straightforward, shall we say. But in other parts of a business, this isn't so tightly defined. Uh, if we're not talking about safety, instead we're talking about commercial risk or program risk or disruption risk, then it's a more judgment. What do we consider acceptable? What have we accepted before? Are we trying to improve things? So that's more, the term we use is qualitative. Uh, and again, consulting with others um, seeking advice from above, comparing with other organizations are a way to consider whether we are measuring risk um, appropriately. In effect, you can benchmark against other organizations, other airlines, etc. So the way you analyze and evaluate risk will depend on the type of risk you're interested in and your context, your own departmental context, what sort of part of a business are you in? And again, the next part of a uh, course, we'll, we'll explore this in more detail. Okay, so those three steps are what we call risk assessment, which is all very well, but it doesn't make any decisions for you. You've got to then decide from the evaluation should you treat a risk? Should you do something about it? Should you mitigate the risk? The reason the international standard uses the word treatment as opposed to mitigate or lower is because risk may be a good thing. A company may choose to take more risk. So how does it treat the risk? It might identify greater opportunities if it takes another risk. But for most of us, most of the time, we're interested in reducing risk, particularly safety or program risk or cost risk. We want to reduce a chance that we'll have an unsafe situation, a chance that we'll overrun our program, a chance that we'll overrun our budget. So most of the time, we're aiming to mitigate risk or reduce risk. And that, this is the step where you decide how you're going to do that. And you may choose one way of doing it, or you may choose a number of ways of doing it. Um, I'm sure some of you will know the term layers of defense. Um, and some of you may have heard of uh, James Reason, Professor James Reason, a British academic who 
came up with the idea of a, what we call a Swiss cheese model, layers of defense and each layer has its weaknesses. And so we put in a number of layers of defense. So one might be a human layer, follow a procedure. There may be a layer, an engineered layer, uh, a failure system, or maybe a protective layer, a fence. Uh, there may be a management layer, checking on things, how the things are being done. So they don't have to be engineered measures. They don't have to be human measures. They can be a mixture. Different ways of reducing risk. A simple sign that says danger, keep out, is a form of risk mitigation. A very simple form, but possibly not always effective. So we need to explore how we're going to treat risk. Um, and once we've treated risk, is the risk now low enough? Or do we have to treat it in a different way or many ways? So once we've done that, and again, we'll explore that later in detail. Once we've completed that, you've completed a risk management process. But there are two other steps that you should do, arguably three. You should record and report what you've done clearly. So people know what you've identified, what the risks are, and what you're doing about it, or what someone else should do about it, and what the resulting risk is level of risk because an organization can only stand understand its risks if each part is reporting their risks and so this communicate and consult comes in again again you're communicating about treatment you're communicating what you found you were commuting your records and lastly because of a principal dynamic things are changing, continual improvement, et cetera. We have to monitor and review what we've done and if things are changing. Is the risk changing? Is the context changing? Have the criteria changed? Have someone identified a new risk? So constantly reconsidering what we've done before, is it appropriate? Is it correct? Is it still valid? And depending on how rapidly things are moving, changing, depends how often you may have to consider the analysis of a given risk or all risks, and the evaluation of those risks and how you're treating them. So to think back to that Qantas example, more recent one with the pins, I'm sure risk processes will have been carried out in the past for moving a 787 to the gate, but the context had changed. So the risk, risks had changed, the nature of risks, the high, uh, level of risks, they probably hadn't been evaluated again. And so the original treatments, qualifications, training, number of people involved in the move, were no longer valid. So I think that's really not, I'm not meaning to pick on Qantas here um, at all. Um, it's just, they were trying to restart like a lot of airlines are and there was an incident which has been investigated. And so we can all learn from that and hopefully avoid that similar events happening to ourselves. Yeah, Qantas got a great safety record. So again, I'm not meaning to have a go at Qantas um, at all. Okay. Um, so one last thing about this is it's all very well having a nice, neat diagram. But like most things in life, it's not quite as simple as that. And you probably go around and round in circles and think that's not quite right. Let's redo that. Hang on, something's changed. Hang on, we haven't finished yet. Let's do that again. And you go round and round and, and make it work in practice. You might have identified and assessed all your risks, but there's two over here that we haven't quite understood yet. So we'll do a bit more work on them and then come back uh, to treating those risks. So in real life, 
it's not a necessary a linear process. You have to be mindful of what changes is occurring, um, even as you do in the process. So in real life, it's a little messy. But by recording and reporting, you should be able to keep a systematic um, discipline process working through. OK, uh, any comments before I move on? Has anyone got a particular example where they've done this and would like to share that? So is that someone volunteering or? No. No. OK. I'm sure we'll talk about some later. OK. <laughs> right, the next. Uh, slide. Um, we we'll just look about it in a bit more detail. We'll look, we'll take safety for example, for obvious reasons. Very much part of life in an airline. Um, and so I've got here a copy. I, I think it's still in date. Um, I didn't notice it changed. Um, quality, safety, and quality policy, which I must admit I've read, and I think it's an excellent one. It's really well written. I think. Um, really, yeah, great example of a safety and quality policy. Um, but I'll point one thing out in particular. Sorry. Sorry, this is going a bit slower than I'd hoped. Okay, so I got there in the end. This is really interesting statement here. The third point, proactively manage changes, identify hazards and manage safety risks in operation, maintenance and training activities, analyze and eliminate or reduce associated risks. So in one sentence, or even a bullet point, it says you must follow, do the risk assessment process, risk analysis, or risk management process indeed. Basic linkly explains, do it proactively. So before an incident, identify the risks. Manage changes is really important. That's a dynamic piece. Changes di introduces new risks. Identify the new hazards effectively and manage with safety risks in the operation, maintenance and training activities. So that's set in the scope, operation, maintenance and training, the scope of the, of the work, analyze and eliminate or reduce. So I think it's, it's beautifully written, really succinct. So that's exactly what you should do. Um, The use of a term eliminate or reduce is interesting. Um, quite a lot of laws around the world now say, put this in place. They say you must eliminate uh, a risk by removing the hazard usually, or if not, do all that you can to reduce that risk. And the terminology that tends to have um, evolved across most of the world, I think, is to reduce risk to low as is reasonably practicable or words similar to that. Um, it's not saying you have to eliminate every risk because that's not possible, but you are to do all that is reasonably practicable. But practicable is the English word. Um, and that, that phraseology um, originates or originally comes from the United Kingdom um, where they suffered a number of really significant accidents, industrial accidents. Um, the ones that come to mind are a chemical factory explosion called Fixborough, huge explosion. Um, they've also had more recently an oil rig explosion in the North Sea oil fields that killed 230 men. 
Um, they've also got a nuclear industry and had in the 1950s, a very bad nuclear accident. Um, and so it's forced for, it forced the British to really think about risk and how you manage risk and what is an acceptable level of risk. Um, the nuclear accident in particular forced them to think, well, how much risk is acceptable? Um, and so this term as low as reasonably practicable evolved through uh, legal processes. Uh, and there's a very, quite a famous legal case where the judge explained what he meant by that. Um, and that has influenced all around the world laws and attitudes towards how you manage, how you identify or accept a level of safety risk. One of the interesting things about that phrase is as low as reasonably practicable does not specify an exact level of risk. It doesn't say one in a million chance, 10 people per year. It doesn't say anything, any hard number. And so it allows that what is considered acceptable or reasonably practical steps to change over time. So what was acceptable when that phrase was first developed and say into the 60s and 70s, it slowly got lower and lower. And every society goes through this process of, particularly as a society becomes richer, that level or a consideration of what is acceptable risk lowers for human safety because we can afford to be safer, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting phrase uh, and it's a very useful one, um, but it also shows that we expect things to improve over time, a level of safety to improve. Uh, and that's certainly true in the aviation industry. Uh, you look at almost any study, Boeing did some excellent studies and it just consistently shows an improving level of safety. Um, and ACAO is now focused on particular types of risk, runway excursions, for example, uh, and loss of control in flight, I think of a two, where they can see we still got more work to do to improve um, the overall level of aviation safety. So I think the safety department has the advantage of its very clear criteria, very developed tools, um, and an absolute commitment within the aviation industry to be safe. I hesitate to say that because we've had examples where um, that's been relatively recently, maybe that hasn't been true. Um, and I think Boeing are have shown that even the most trusted companies that really understood risk can lose their way a little bit uh, and hopefully they'll recover. Um, but it's a constant, constant battle to maintain the attitudes, uh, maintain the culture of safety and to constantly improve and improve. But we have a lot of tools, a lot of tools in, in these technical fields. Is anyone from safety or quality who would like to say something on that? Anh chị nào của SQD có comment gì không ạ? Sorry, what was that? Dạ, ở SQD là hay làm cái này nhất. Vâng. Chị có comment gì không? Chị không làm ở SQD nào. <cười> Yeah, SQD online hết rồi. Anh chị nào SQD online còn muốn nói gì không ạ? No. No, I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I think I'll have other chances to comment. Um, so my next slide, I, I, I'm gonna just go on, sorry. So what about other departments? Um, you still have the same process, um, but what is different is the context of your department may be different to that of safety. The scope is clearly different because it, you, you're interested in what you have control of or what influences your objectives. But criteria are, is obvious, often less easily defined. How much risk is acceptable? What sort of risk is acceptable? Um, again, laws will apply. Um, commercial laws, international commercial laws, treaties, um, I don't know, dangerous goods in the cargo department, for example. Security is usually fairly clear, um, but not as easily defined as perhaps in the safety areas. That said, you may well have a policy similar to safety and quality that clearly says what's expected of you in terms of managing risk. And if you have, then there's a good place to start. What are we required? What is the policy on, I don't know, security, uh, on cargo handling, on, I don't know, you, you name it, uh, various departments will have clear policy and that's a really good place to start on this scope, context and criteria. Um, objectives, work out exactly what the objective is and therefore what you are trying to mitigate or control and then apply in the process. Again, the, the processes may not be as clearly defined as they would be in a technical department where there's a lot of examples of how to do it. That said, if it's a non-technical field, you're probably not having to do such a complicated process. And I'll explain that again. Okay. So having stepped through risk identification, risk analysis, risk, risk evaluation, I'll now go and we'll explore that in some more detail. Analysis of risk. And here we can use a, another international standard. So the main one I've been talking about is 31,000. This standard is 31,010. And it's a technical, I think its title now is technical dependency, but what it means is really technical risk analysis. But its scope has expanded to now include a much wider range of analysis tools. So it can be tools from financial and commercial fields as well as technical fields. So it's a very good standard, uh, somewhat more involved than 31,000. But Vic, you can usually find some guidebooks which help you understand this standard. What it says is there are essentially three types of analysis you can do. You can do a qualitative analysis, uh, effectively a judgment-based analysis without using numbers. And normally that uses a combination of likelihood and consequence expressed with terms, and I'll, I'll show you an example. Semi-quantitative analysis, which is uses numbers, but they're not rigorous, they're not mathematically rigorous numbers, but they help us to compare risks. 10 is worse than five, for example, which is worse than one on our scale. And we use scales all the time in our lives, you know, surveys, pick between one and 10, do you agree with this statement? Sort of thing. So we're used to these sort of semi-quantitative scales, but we have to be a little careful with them. And then lastly, is a quantitative approach, quantitative risk assessment, QRA, 
and statistical techniques. And that would be used sparingly, only used where you really need to, because this can soak up a lot of resources and time. But in some areas, again, in the technical fields, it may be appropriate to do a very narrow, but very detailed piece of risk analysis. So what does all that mean in practice? Okay. Quantitative, semi-quantitative and qualitative approaches. I'll take each of you up in turn. What do we mean by a qualitative risk assessment? So if you remember before lunch, before morning tea, I think, um, I said that risk is defined or can be measured by, usually measured by probability and consequence. So we can have a little scale. We can we say the consequence is bad or high or significant, use different words, or it's medium or it's low consequence. And we could have three steps or we could have five steps, it doesn't matter. And then we can use words to describe probability, likelihood. It is likely that something will happen in the next year or over a 12 month period or over a flight. Or it is possible that it might happen. It could happen, it may not. Or it is unlikely to happen. Sorry, I've, I've shortened these words, I shouldn't have. Unlikely, rare, improbable. There's many different words, certainly in the English language we can use and most languages to explore what we mean, but use a word that works for your team, for your people in your context. Now, if you consider something bad happening and it's likely to happen, and clearly that's a bad risk, it's a high risk. So we can use a word like major or catastrophic, no, major or severe or very high, which merely means it's a big risk. But if it's the, prob the consequence is limited, it won't matter too much, and it's very unlikely to happen anyway, that must be a low risk. If you think of gambling, you're likely to lose a small amount of money, unlikely to lose a small amount of money, who cares? You're likely to lose a lot of money, I'm really interested. Maybe I won't place a bet. So this is a very simple, logical way of rating risk. The more likely something is, the higher the risk, and the worse the outcome, the consequence, the higher the risk. And this is probably the simplest analysis one can do on risk. And you see this, this is, Free, free by free, as it's called a free by free matrix, is fine for very simple risk analysis. And so what you might do is do a very quick risk analysis across your department and just rate it like this. And then, okay, we've got five risks that are high or major. Let's go back and do them in more detail. So we concentrate and put our effort where it really matters instead of doing the same detailed work, perhaps across all risks. And the international standard does say, start at a high level, quick, quick and dirty, find out what you're really interested in and go into more detail in the, in the ones that may be, may be more significant. Okay, has everyone stayed with me on that? Please, please shout or put your hand up if, you want that explained again? I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, when analyzing with in the chain management process, we had a problem determining the uh, prob uh, probability uh, of the risk occurring 
it is very difficult, uh, difficult to determine the uh, uh, possibility in a reasonable way. Can you uh, can you say your appearance with uh, this? Okay, I'll just repeat to make sure I heard that correctly. So you're saying it it can sometimes be difficult to assess the likelihood of a probability of a risk. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And luckily, I've got some slides on that one. <laughs> sometimes it's the unknown, unknown, isn't it? And uncertainty. Um, if you're really uncertain, particularly if it's a high consequence risk, um, but you really don't know the likelihood, so it could be major, it could be moderate, or could or major or moderate, for example, is assume the worst and then go and do some more work, do more consultation, perhaps do some research to see if we can understand the likelihood more or better, understand the likelihood better. If you're still uncertain, it's probably best to assume the worst, assume a higher risk and do all you can to treat that risk within reason. Does that help? Does that help explain? Sorry, is it Hong? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I uh, I'm the, I'm thinking about your experience. Explain. <laughs> I, I. Yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, you're quite right. Sometimes it's really difficult to predict the, the likelihood, the probability of of an event. So what I'm saying is either do more research to try and narrow the uncertainty, make you more certain, or take what we call a precautionary approach. Be careful and assume the worst. Assume it's higher rather than lower. And manage that risk as if it's high, as if it's a major risk. So put in place some mitigations, put in place some procedures, maybe um, monitor the situation. There's a number of things you could do until you gain more confidence on the risk. Is that helpful? I'll come back to it anyway. So. I'll make a note. I'll make a note. Like, like, like that's, uh, that is to define a way uh, quantitative. You could absolutely do quantitative analysis. Yeah. If it's if you've got data, and that would be one way to reduce your uncertainty. Okay, thank you. I just okay. Um, an alternative way, if you have resources and it's a really important risk, or you have a lot of information, <coughs> and again, the technical people may do, you can do a quantitative analysis. So you can have this again is a simple one. We're saying we're measuring likelihood in terms of numbers. And we're measuring consequence in terms of numbers. It could be the number of people exposed to a hazard, the number of failures, number of errors, and the likelihood measured in probability, number of times per year, number of times per 100 years. And we use real numbers. Um, possible is 10 times more likely than unlikely. Likely is 10 times more likely than possible, for example. Medium is 10 times worse than low, and so on. And we use real numbers. These could be measured in 
uh, like I say, events per year and number of people exposed. So this is the most complicated way and normally you would leave this to people who are trained to do this sort of work to make sure it's done right. An alternative way is this is a semi-quantitative method where we can still use numbers, but the numbers don't really mean a lot there. Two is bigger than one, but we don't know how much bigger. This is like your, from a scale of one to 10, how bad do you think, how good was that film, whatever. Um, so at least you can, when you do your multiplication, three by three is nine. Okay, nine is worse than one by one, which is one. So you can start ranking risks and say, well, we're interested in any risk above five or our top 10 risks. The risks that score the highest will take 10 and we'll have a look at them in more detail. So that's a semi-quantitative way. And that is a lot of industries will use this method. You just have to remember these numbers are just a scale. They're not real hard numbers. So you'll see this often and you'll see this often. This you'll see only in the more expert fields um, and usually in the technical fields. It's very uh, analytical method. Okay, any questions on that? I'm, I'm guessing that quite a few of you will have seen something like this. Certainly if you're in the safe, uh, safety and technical departments. Okay. Okay, so what does that mean? So this is another way of looking at that matrix. We've got our likelihood scale and a consequence scale. And if it's low likelihood and low consequence, we've got a low risk. If it's um, increased probability or co likelihood or increased consequence, we've got a medium risk. And if it's likely and higher consequence, we've got a high risk. So risk, if you were using numbers, risk equals the likelihood times a consequence. Um, But, and that's how we get our matrix. A matrix is like a simple form of a graph. <coughs> okay, the problem is um, some risks will occur from quite frequently, um, but the consequence is not very much, it's limited. Someone made a mistake, someone else noticed it, okay, cost us a bit of time. Someone had to write the incident report, but nothing went wrong. But that same risk could equally have had a bad consequence. Someone didn't notice the error and the aircraft was damaged. Same risk, someone forgot to do something. But in one case, incidental, not too bad, of a case really bad. And um, these are the words that I've seen used by some companies. They talk about the small stuff that happens a lot as a problem and the bad stuff that doesn't happen very often, but they fear is called the worst case. So the oil industry talks in these terms, problems and worst cases, the mining industry in some countries like Australia use these terms. Uh, and so sometimes you can't really rate the risk. You don't know which risk are we talking about, which outcome, but the most likely one or the worst one. So sometimes you have to put both in so that you can communicate perhaps to a more senior level that needs to sign off on expenditure saying, we might have a few instances, but we could lose an aircraft. And I have, I, I do have an example of that where I had to report exactly that 
working for an airport. And I had to explain to them that other airports had had incidents and near misses. And if they pros uh, progressed with their project, they had to accept there was quite a high risk and a possibility of an aircraft accident. And I'm pleased to say they said, OK, we won't do the project this year. We'll do it next year once everyone's had time to get ready. So that was quite a relief. <laughs> and it went off very well, the project. But this is exactly the, the risk that had to be communicated. There was a significant a likelihood that they would have incidents. There was a possibility that an aircraft would be lost. Um, that's all they needed to know. They made the right decision. Um, we'll put the project off for a year until everyone is ready. So this is real. This really is the sort of risk that sometimes you have to understand. The problem is this is probability problem. Um, exactly the question I was asked. Well, how likely is it? And the problem, even if you've had an incident, like here, you know how bad that incident was. But you still don't know how likely, because you've only had one. Was it one in a hundred year event that you had a bad day? Or is it going to happen next month as well? And you've had the same incident again, but this one it was worse. Oops, sorry. So until you have some information, some statistics, some examples, perhaps from overseas, somewhere else, other airlines, other industries even, you may not be able to work out the probability. It's easy to be think, oh, we've had one, therefore it's going to happen again and again. Well, maybe. It may be you just had a very bad day. Or you've had one and not much, it didn't, wasn't really a problem. Oh, that's all right. It's only a low risk. Hang on. But it could have been a significant problem. So yeah, the question about probability, thank you for that. It's really quite difficult sometimes to know the likelihood of an event. Um, and it's easy to be mis to misunderstand the likelihood because until you've had some indicators of things going wrong, you really don't know how likely it is. Um, so one way to treat that is to look for the precursors, the look for the indication that something didn't go right that could have led to a worst case. People making mistakes, but nothing went wrong. Measure the mistakes because that's giving you an indication of how likely your risk is. If there's a lot of mistakes, you're more likely to have that outcome that you're avoiding, trying to avoid. But if you're only having a few errors, then it's less likely. So look for these indicators. That's the correct term, indicators of an event, a risk occurring. And Professor James Reason showed that as an arrow in his diagram, Swiss cheese diagram. Um, sequence of events, and you're measuring the sequence, even though it didn't lead to the accident or the loss or the delay. Again, some departments are better equipped to do this because they're resourced to, to do this sort of analysis. But even in the more quantitative uh, departments, how often we're having a delay, how often is that cargo wrong aircraft? How often are we dropping a container? How often have they been parked in the wrong place? These are all indicators that something is not quite right. That could lead to a really significant problem. So analyze the precursors, the small stuff to understand and avoid the big stuff. Does that make sense? I think that's a real practical lesson is worry about the small stuff um, because that's telling you what big stuff that could happen. And you're more likely to have evidence. You've got more, you can measure it because it's happening more often.
Okay. Any questions, any uh, comments? That last one on probability was really good. Thank you very much for that. Okay, seemingly not. Okay. Just thinking how best to do this now. Um, so much easier when everyone's in the same room. Never mind. Um, so in your own minds, think about how, what I've been talking about and how you would do it in your own departments. So far, we've gone through the theory. We've talked about the theory of risk, identifying risk, the theory of how to measure it, high, low, medium, the theory of how to try and get a sense of probability. But what does that mean in practice? How do we do it in practice? How do we measure consequence? How do we measure probability? So, we've got to measure consequence. And this here is an example, an example from my own background, hence New Zealand dollars. But it could be any dollars, of course. It could be any currency. And these numbers have got to match the context, the organization involved. So this is a relatively, shall we say, a medium-sized business, a medium-sized airline, small to medium-sized airline. And in this case, it's been decided at the airline level group level that will measure conse uh, consequence in a semi-quantitative or qualitative to semi-quantitative way. And we use a five-step scale. Now, the reason I've shown a five-step scale is because this is normal. Most companies for company-wide risks will use a five-step scale. But you don't have to. You can use more. And it depends how detailed company wants to get. So in this case, we start at the top. What is catastrophic? What is the worst possible outcome for the group? What could lead to the group condition leads in a rapid demise of a group, collapse within weeks or months, bankruptcy? And in this case, the company involved could withstand maybe a $500 million hit, but no more. That is likely to wipe out the company, the airline. So that's a financial way of measuring that risk. We say from a business perspective, we couldn't withstand anything like that. So that would be catastrophic. And when you build a scale, down from that. And here you'll see that scale drops by about 10, 10, 10, 10, to a point where the number is, yeah, you don't want to lose that money, but it would typically be managed within the department or project. And each of these is described. This sort of number, the impact on the group would typically be reported and managed within a division, subsidiary, or venture, for example. This sort of number, impact on group that is of concern at a senior level and would typically require informing external stakeholders, shareholders, for example. A severe condition that significantly degrades or weakens a group. This is really bad stuff, but it, it doesn't go bankrupt. These are the sort of numbers. So that there is a very typical example of how a business could rate the consequence of business or financial risk.
Now, for an airline where we are mindful, we are responsible for the safety of large numbers of people. Clearly, safety is really has to be on the main scale. If an airline loses an aircraft through negligence or its own failures, or maybe happens twice, for example, then it is quite likely that that airline will no longer exist. Um, Boeing is being pretty close to that with its uh, A3737 MAX saga, two aircraft, entirely its own fault, the airline, uh, the, sorry, the company's fault. Plus their response to the accident has been very poor. They try to blame the pilots. Then they're trying to find excuses. Um, pretty close to destroying the company. It certainly very significantly has harmed their brand. Their culture has clearly um, been at fault. So they've been somewhere up here on that scale. These numbers will be very different for Boeing, such a large company. But this is the sort of thing that's happened and this is the effect on the company. Very severe impact. And other airlines will have been through similar problems. Sometimes the accident, for example, may degrade their strength, degrade their brand, raise questions in the public mind. Um, and of course, airlines have gone bankrupt for commercial reasons. And the pandemic has put a lot under stress and many of the smaller ones um, have failed. So this is very real for an airline. This happens. These things do happen in the aviation business. But exactly what this scale looks like will depend on the health, the financial health of the company, its balance sheet, um, its ability to borrow money, etc. So hopefully that's been a useful example. It's a real example. Uh, it's a very typical example of a very high level way of measuring risk at the most senior levels of a company. Any comments on that one? No. Um. Sorry, just a quick question, for example, I'm looking at the financial outcome and mm -hmm. explaining that, for example, is a severe major, so severe financial outcome is 10 times more than the major, is that correct? That's right, yes. Should we do that for another example, if we try to create one, is it like always 10 times um, from, for example, major to severe? Or it can have different numbers, like 20 times? Or like yeah, like yeah. Um, the reason for 10 is it's a, a logarithmic scale. So there's some mathematical strength to it, I suppose. And somehow you've got to get from a number that really doesn't matter too much to a number that really matters. And how how is the best way to do it? You could go equal steps, um, but that really doesn't reflect this, how we manage companies, the way we report within companies in that projects will typically manage their own budget and then it gets up to a division level which will manage their own budget. This seems to work really well, this idea of an order of magnitude, a meaningful change. Um, I've seen this done with threes, one, three, nine, 27, and so on each step being three times bigger than the other one. Um, a slight problem with that is you may end up with more steps. So you might have seven or eight steps to get to the big number at the top. Um, but they're perfectly valid. Any scale, as long as it's logical and it's relatively easy to use, you can 
be fairly clear, well, this is the level of risk we're talking about. This is the level of consequence. Uh, if it's too fine, then you get this long debate about, well, is it a major or a severe, perhaps avoiding the detracting from the decision that has to be made. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, that's clear. Thank you. Um, the other thing I think is worth pointing out is there's an equivalence between these two. There's a, you're inferring a value of life, a dollar value of life. It infers that a single fatality is about that number. Um, you get, could get into a long debate about what is the value of human life and there's different ways of measuring it. And a lot of organizations have do that. Um, fire departments will sometimes have a value of life for how much should be put into the design of buildings, for example. Um, but this isn't meant to be an exact uh, equivalence. This isn't saying a human life is $5 million. It's saying that a fatality due to company's own fault would have an impact on the group if it was a public for example and people would probably be in need to be informed how come you're not looking after the public you're not protecting them so the equivalence is probably more from here to here hmm. uh and yeah, the major difficulty due to action or inaction for aviation, yeah, for hàng không này để lỗi hàng không. Còn bên dưới ví dụ như là chỉ liên quan đến severe injury hoặc public injury. Không nhưng mà cái không nhưng mà cái này không cái nào. Vâng, để hỏi lại nhá. <laughs> okay, so there's one question. So um, if you look at the safety outcome of serious, there's a word death, staff death, right? Mm -hmm. And on major, there is fertility. So is there a difference between death and fertility in this case? Fatality, yeah. Fatality, yeah. Yeah, fatal. Um, this is, sorry, I should have been clearer. This is to suggest that harming a member of a public or an innocent party who is not involved in your work is worse than harming your own people. This is an interesting debate, but part of the argument is that the staff understand the risks they are working with and so they have accepted a level of risk they, they gain from taking that risk they gain employment they gain purpose etc the member of a public who is innocently just wanting to go from a to b does not understand the risk did not choose to take any risk they assumed they would be safe and therefore the duty of care, maybe, but duty we have to the innocent party, the uninformed party is higher. That's how that argument goes. Some companies would say, no, we're, we're equally concerned about anyone. Uh, but certainly I think in the public mind, most societies would accept that the innocent party, the party that does not know, has no control, is simply following their instructions, should expect a higher level of care than those who have been trained, have chosen to undertake a certain career, um, and have some control over their own risk. If they are not comfortable or risk, why have they not reported it and asked for more protection? So that's why there's an argument. You don't have to accept it, but some would that harm to a member of public is higher than harm to your own people. It's a social debate. There's no absolute right or wrong to this argument. Yeah. Very useful. Good questions. Thank you. Any other questions, Amen? Basically, you could spend a lot of time debating this one. <laughs> and like I said, I'm not saying this is 
you know, everyone has to use the same one. It's just an example. Example, it took a lot of debate to get to. It's a real one, but it was, it's out of date now, but out of date in terms of these numbers, but otherwise it's it absolutely a real one. Mm. Okay. I think there's no question, you can move on. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was one way of, of looking at, um, at uh, impact. Um, we've also got to now look at as a qualitative or semi-quantitative approach. We've also got now look at how do we measure probability in qualitative ways? What terms do we use? So here we've got five steps. That original example I gave you was three steps, remember? Now we want to go five. Because five by five is a normal way of doing it. If you look at the FAA scales, it's five by, some of them are five by five. Um, and most developed companies, larger companies will have a similar scale. Okay. So likelihood, we can use all sorts of words and excuse me here, I'm using obviously the English words, but I think last time we did this, we did also explore Vietnamese words. The problem is there's lots of different ways that we as humans talk about probability. Uh, and here's an example, albeit using English words, that all are sort of mean the same. They're all ways of explaining probability, but there's no numbers. Infrequent, doesn't happen very often. That sounds a bit like improbable to me. Uh, maybe conceivable. Frequent sounds a bit like almost certain or certain and probable, probably. So, um, and I'm sure, I suspect it's very similar in Vietnamese. It's, we use these words in our everyday lives without really defining them um, because it's so difficult to define probability. But the important point is to decide what words you're going to use and what they mean. Um, and so everyone is using the same words in the same way. Um, and the words we use will have evolved from when we were children, I'm sure, and the environments we're used to and the professions we take up. So there's a number of ways you do this, but you've got to somehow, if you're using a qualitative approach, decide what words we're all going to use as a team. And ideally, as a group. So I can show you some examples. So these real examples, uh, these come from the oil industry, for example, but could equally be an aviation one. A term. So here, a term is very frequent. We describe what it means. So this is an aviation one, actually, sorry repeated event. So it actually does happen in the industry. How often? About 10 times a year. Or maybe we're going to use the word seldom, known to occur from time to time, once every 30 years. So this is a way of using words but also being very clear what they mean in terms of probability. Um, this method, method was first developed by Shell in the 70s. Um, and the oil industry, similar to the aviation industry in that you've got very big expenditures, big projects, expensive assets, and when things go wrong, they go very badly wrong. Um, so they need, they wanted a way of consistently understanding risk. And they were saying, well, um, 
ha oh, whoops, sorry, has been seen in our industry. They'd use terms like that. Um, maybe not just in Shell, but across the oil industry, in the global oil industry, and they all traveled a lot, the oil industry people. So they generally knew what was going on. And that way they could have a clear understanding of what they meant by these words. Um, and you can express the numbers in different ways, whatever works for your yourselves and your own department, your own people. So because certain expected occurred monthly, almost certain expected occur, or expect to see it frequently, uh, typically every year. Could anticipate seeing it during a career. Okay, that's probably one in 30 years. So you're taking people's expertise and experience. And certainly when we're, everyone introduced themselves this morning, there's clearly a lot of experience in, in your company or in your group. You could probably get a group of people together and do exactly this without too much difficulty. Yes, I've seen that happen. I've heard of that happening. How oh, that happened in South America in the eighties, whatever. Um, that's the sort of way you get people together, you consult and write, write, this is what we mean when we use these words. You do need to be clear on the scope. Are we talking about known to occur from time in our country or in our airline or in the industry or in our part of the world? So you need to be clear when you develop these, go through this process. What exactly do you mean? But it's quite a useful process if you're starting a proper risk process is to get the people you're going to use as your experts and get them to talk about this and agree this is what we mean. This is the word we're going to use. This is what it means. This is the numerical value. Again, no right or wrong answer. It's got to suit your own context. I'm sorry, I, I don't realize the difference between the language skill and the property skill. Sorry, I didn't hear that correctly, clearly. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand about the language skill and the property skill. Oh, who's doing the values? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you mean? No, um, they, you give two examples, right, about likelihood and probability scale. Mm. And and what is the difference between these? Ah, okay. So this might be a problem of the English language. Um, the French version of a standard, the standard is issued in English and French. The French um, and the Germans actually don't have this problem. They don't use the word likelihood and probability. They only have one word. Uh, the English language has these two words and people use them in slightly different ways. They actually mean exactly the same thing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> blame the English language for this one. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's uh, when we were writing the standard, we had exactly this problem that the English speaking teams said, but they mean the different things, but they couldn't explain how they were different. Um, and in simple terms, this is a more mathematical expression. This is a more everyday expression. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a very good question. I'm sorry, I should have explained that. This, this is a problem of the English language. Um, you might want to pick up the French standard and start with that one, actually. I personally think it's slightly better because it defines risk in a slightly better way than the English version. Mm -hmm. um, and French would probably be a better place to start actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's just these slightly subtle differences because of language, yeah. Um, but technically the, the, these two tables are the same, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So this number is the same as that number. It's just expressed in a different way. Okay. Yes. This is expressed in per year, as expressed per year, but just shown differently. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's what are people used to? How are people used to talking about these uh, very low numbers, very small numbers? If you're a scientist, 
you'd you'd show it differently. You'd show it to the power of to the power minus three. Or um, if you're an engineer, it would probably be like this. If you're not, you're probably like this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. And I apologize. I should just have put one up. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, I should have put the French one up. There you go. <laughs> okay. So now we've, this is all getting a little theory and we're going to have to get practical shortly. Sorry. But, um, okay. Then we've got to combine these and I showed you a very simple three by three matrix. Um, but like I said, most companies will use a more detailed scale and Five by five is the most common. Um, and so they'll express probability and consequence. And just like the three by three matrix, a bad thing happening frequently is really bad, a high risk. A less important thing happening rarely, infrequently is a lower risk. And so in these matrix, we usually use colors to indicate green is good, red is bad, orange, gold, yellow, any colors of suit that people are familiar with. Sometimes blue is used here, um, but this is quite useful because color gives you a sense of a risk. Red is bad, green is good. Um, and again, I'm sure very many of you will have seen something like this. Trouble is, like a lot of these things, um, it's not quite as simple as it looks. When is it red or when is it orange? Should that one be yellow? Should that one be yellow? Should that be orange? Even these things aren't necessarily straightforward. And so this one is an example where we're concerned, we're most concerned about probability. We don't like things that happen frequently. And so even if it's catastrophic and it's extremely unlikely, it's, it's been given an orange. It could be like this, where because it's catastrophic, it's red, doesn't matter how frequently or unfre unlikely it is. So this is all part of, I'll just go that again, see the difference. The work has to be done to decide, okay, well, what matrix are we going to use? Are we interested? Are we re adverse because of consequence? We just don't like bad things. Or are we more interested in how frequently something happens? Only through discussion, internal discussion, can you decide what scale to use. And sometimes we can use numbers to see what the numbers mean and then just change the numbers to colors. Um, but it's a piece of work that has to be done. And ideally, everyone use the same. Because if everyone's using the same, then you can report consistently across departments and across the group. And this is what we call a balanced one. Equally three by three, two oranges, two oranges, fairly consistent, three by three. So this is probably the place to start. Does everyone understand what I've just done there? It's not a hard and fast rule. You've got to decide for yourselves what colors you're going to use or what values you're going to use to wait to describe a risk. But once you've done that, you don't have to do it again. Okay. Any questions on that? I have some comments. In my opinion, something if the consequence is catastrophic, so it should be a way um, uh, 
in the rust color, no matter what uh, about the possibility? Yeah, so that one. Mm -hmm. If it's bad, don't accept it. Yeah, a very um, valid view to take for an airline, I think. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Don't accept anything like loss of an aircraft, for example. Just don't accept it. Do whatever you can. Treat it as a high risk. Mm. Very valid point. Very valid argument to make, I think. Certainly, perhaps more so than that one. <laughs> oh, it's unlikely. We're well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Consequence rated. Don't like bad things happening because they can be really bad. Mm. Okay. I'm a bit worried we're, we're stepping through quite a few concepts here. So um, please stop me if, if you want to recap on anything. Just looking at the time now as well. Um, looks like we're due a break, can't we? Yeah. Am I right, Tian? Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good. We can have a quick 15 minutes break. Okay, that's good. I just feel I'm, I'm loading everyone with quite a lot of ideas here. Mm -hmm. I know Bray could probably do everyone good. Okay, okay. Okay, okay see you in 15 minutes. Yes, so 15 minutes, we'll see each other again. About risk. Uh, and that's that's really important because um, there are examples in history where risks were not reported. And the one that comes to my mind, I suppose, because of my background, is Chernobyl. The Soviet system was not an open system. It, it didn't like bad news, and so people didn't report bad news. Uh, the Soviet nuclear industry, or some parts of it, knew that that type of reactor, Chernobyl, had a weakness in its design. But because they didn't talk about it, they wouldn't openly talk about it, the engineers at Chernobyl didn't know that there was a problem with a design. And for a number of reasons, they broke some rules and that weakness became a disaster. Um, so it is really important. That's probably perhaps an extreme example, but it is an example of you have to be open about risk, prepared to listen to what might seem like bad news and confront it and say, what are we going to do about it? Really important. So this idea of setting a, a, a hard limit uh, and then taking set action is quite simple. It has its weakness. It, there needs to be some flexibility. It might be that you've identified a risk that is in a, a uh, area that you only report, say, to general management level. But that doesn't mean that actually, maybe we should pass this one up and just say, we've got this risk, we're doing this about it, but just to let you know. Um, it's better to reveal a, a risk than to hide a risk. But that takes a culture of, of openness, a culture that isn't immediately going to blame. Um, and so that's part of taking cultural factors into account. Um, and you may have various levels. You may decide anything below here will only keep within the apartment normally. Anything above here will start reporting up. Anything above another level and we'll report it to the highest levels. This is used. I've seen this used. I've seen it used um, and fail. 
Um, there was a company that I witnessed. Um, it was a state-owned company, actually. They had exactly this. And they had a number of risks in this area. Um, it was an energy company. Uh, I can actually go further. I can say it was a coal mining company. There was a risk here that said that a particular mine would not become productive because it was unsafe. There was another risk about international coal prices and another risk about foreign exchange rates. Because they all sat in this region, none of them got reported to the board. But all three occurred at the same time. The mine did not become productive. Coal prices dropped and the exchange rate went the wrong way. Bank, the company went bankrupt. Maybe they should have been having a discussion about, we've got quite a lot of risks in the medium area. Maybe we should be having a conversation at the board level. Uh, but they didn't. So it's quite a simple method. It works quite well. But like all these things, we have to use best judgment and be prepared to talk about risk and say, I'm getting concerned we have quite a number of risks. Maybe we should be reporting. Maybe we should be having a group discussion on this, for example. So I guess the point here is we have these tools. They work quite well, but we must continue to use our intelligence, best judgment, and think, let's have a conversation, for example. Being careful not to uh, over be overly concerned about risks. Um, you certainly want to don't want to create a condition where a certain department is seen as being so risk adverse, you, people no longer listen to them. So um, it's a conversation. That's why management get paid to be managers, I guess. OK. Um, so it's a tool. It works really well. It can be quite simple. But don't allow the tool to blind you to good judgment. OK. So then there comes the question. There's a number of things to be developed. There needs to be a set of consistent scales across the group, I would suggest. Um, there needs to be a consistent matrix, and I, I'm going to suggest one. Um, and there needs to be a, a, ideally a common understanding of the appropriate action for a given level of risk. OK, a any points on that? No. Okay. Okay. I was going to suggest an exercise, but I think what we've learned today is very difficult to do an exercise with this, uh, with everyone in in different uh, locations. Um, but never mind. We'll we'll work something out. Okay. So this is, if you recall, this is the risk identification, risk analysis, risk evaluation, risk assessment process that I've been through in some detail. Um, we've now developed up a matrix, or concept of a matrix, where we've combined likelihood and consequence to analyze risk, to give it a level, um, and we've explored but it can be done qualitatively, semi-quantitative, or quantitatively. But then what? So we've identified some risks. How do we report them? 
how do we describe these risks? How do we record them? So that's where a tool called risk registers comes in, a register of risks. And this here is an example of a risk register and they come in different forms, but this is very typical. Um, and they're quite common. It works really quite well. First, we identify a risk and we describe it. Uh, we probably identify the hazard first. Um, it may be energy or electrical power. We identify risk, electrocution, um, arcing, sparking, fires, for example. And we describe what may cause it, why we're concerned. And then we rate the likelihood, consequence, and therefore using our matrix, we identify a level of risk. So um, this is a very simplified one, but we describe probably the hazard first, what the risk is, maybe something about context, and then the likelihood, impact, and severity. Now, there's different ways of thinking about risk. We can think about the raw risk. If we didn't do any protection, what is the likelihood of this happening? We can talk about risk as it currently is, given our current procedures, precautions, controls. And that would be typically called current risk meaning what is the risk now, given the way that we operate. And say you've decided the risk is very high, you think we need to do more about this, we need to mitigate this risk. So you can describe, okay, we plan to introduce additional training, review our procedures, and look for new technology for protection, for example. I made three things you should hide to do. So you write these in, new technology research, improved procedures, improved training. You then can rate, does that reduce the likelihood? Does that reduce the consequence? So a technology solution might reduce the consequence. For example, using an electrical pump instead of a petrol powered pump. Um, or something might reduce the likelihood like improved training. And then you rate the risk again, given these mitigations. And so in this case, we've gone from a red to an orange. You might still think, that's still quite high. Maybe we should be doing some more. So you can explore different mitigations. How do other people do this? Rate it until you are comfortable. That is as low as where you can reasonably get that risk. And then you do the same for your next risk and so on. Now, some technical fields, these risk registers can be quite long, quite a lot of risks. Um, and there's numerous types of software you can use, numerous, numerous of software that do this for you. You still have to do the thinking. You still have to work out what the controls are, but it helps you to list and filter risks. Um, you don't want too many. If you get too many, they don't get read. Um, you need too many. You need too many resources to manage all these risks. They get out of date, and then no one takes any notice. But you need enough to accurately describe a risk and to cover off all your real risks. Um, and also, you need to decide which risks you're going to report upwards. You may have 10 very detailed technical risks, but you don't want to report that up to, say, group level. You might say, we have a number of risks in this area. We rate the overall risk as high. 
So you might simplify some risk, group them together for reporting purposes. The important thing is to tell the right, pass the right information, tell the right story. So the senior people understand the level of risk faced by the company or the group. There's a very interesting example of too many risks. Um, aviation, albeit not civil aviation, is military aviation. Uh, the British lost a very advanced Nimrod aircraft in Afghanistan due to an accident. Uh, it was a very advanced model of a Nimrod. Um, if you're aware, Nimrod is uh, a reconnaissance aircraft, jet propelled reconnaissance aircraft, um, based on the original Comet airline of the 1950s. But, uh, and this one had been modified in some ways uh, and was being used reconnaissance over Afghanistan. Fuel leaked out, there was a big fire, and the aircraft was lost. The investigation was scathing. Everyone know what I mean by scathing? It was the investigating um, judge was shocked by what he found. And his report was was brutal, was really, really brutal. One of the things he discovered was they had to do a risk assessment and they did a risk assessment on this aircraft and the modifications. But there were so many risks listed that they even hadn't even completed the risk register, but they put it in the report. No one had read it. And so the cause of the accident was listed in the register, but had never been rated because there were just too many risks for anyone to, to consider. And one of the core lessons that have come out of that for British, and I think it's influenced a lot of thinking in the world, across the world in safety cases is your safety case, risk-based safety case must be manageable. It must be of a scale that people will actually use it. Um, it will be a scale that allows it to be used and influence, in that case, the design of the aircraft, but influence your operation or your procedures, etc. So these risk registers, they need to be detailed enough to contain all the risks, but they mustn't be so massive and complex that they get out of date, get dismissed, or frankly, just never get read. It has to be a practical tool. So a really important lesson, that one. Um, and since that time, what's considered a good safety case has shrunk in scale. A safety case has to be a manageable size, meaningful size. Yeah, so that, that's a really interesting case, that one. Mm. Um, uh, anyone here seen examples of risk registers that they can point? I'm sure some of you are you're using these. Uh, anyone who is, uh, are you used, can I ask, are you using a software package or a lot of people use Excel um, and just keep a list? Some use online tools. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you hear that? No, I didn't. Sorry. No. Uh, we use Excel to um, identify risk and uh, analyze this. Uh, Excel. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's very common. Yeah. Um, it works very well. Um, my own problem I found with it is by the time you've emailed it to someone else or had a copy back, which one's the most up to date copy? <laughs> um, which is why the online or shared version is often a good way to go when you only have one truth. But hey, Excel is used a lot, I think, because you can customize it to your own needs. 
yeah very good mm. but there are uh, quite a lot of online tools as well which are similar mm. um aqd was an old one but, um, mm. okay so does everyone understand that this is a very simple one here and i i should have put perhaps more columns at the front to say first you describe your risk you describe its cause or its hazard and then rate it uh, we also the IQD system, but it's only for re, uh, record and report the incident that uh, may um, that already occur in the, our operations. It's uh, not for describe the risk. So I've, uh, I'm not picking everything up on my microphone. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I think I heard that AQD is used. Is, is that right? Uh, okay, so he said that yes, they do use AQD software, but it's only used for recording and reporting. But right. Um, for describing the risk. Okay, yep, right. Mm -hmm. Software and Excel. Radio, okay, well, thank you for it. Yep, so it's good to hear that some people are familiar with these. Um, they don't have to be complicated. Um, the main thing is to be able to record, consistently rate and report risks. Uh, and it's quite common to also sorry, show them on, you could put, so example, risk number 10, risk number five, risk number four, and actually show them on a matrix pictorially. That can be quite useful for helping to uh, report the whole risk profile. Um, that's quite common as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking where to move now. So it's now three quarters now. We've got three quarters now. Okay. I think the best thing now is to get ready for tomorrow. Um, do we have a 10 questions? Have that been communicated to everyone? Uh, I thought that you wanted to have it after the class. Is that correct? We can do it now. Uh, no, what I was thinking is perhaps we just introduce that there are 10 questions at the last thing today. Okay. And perhaps people can work on them. And then we talk about, have them, people can have them. And then perhaps we talk about them middle of tomorrow morning at okay. tea break, after tea. Okay. After um, would you like me to show the questions or um, just, I don't know, what do you want me to do? Should, shall we do it at um, in half an hour before uh, we close? Uh, yes. So, uh, wait, so do you want me to show it, right? Show the questions? Uh, at quarter past, um, quarter past four. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right here. Okay. Right, um, so we've talked about scales, we've talked about matrix, we've talked a little bit about risk registers now. So we're gonna use these tools tomorrow. Uh, but I thought what we do for the next half an hour is just go back to objectives, if I may. Um, because remember we talked about risk is defined by objectives. So before we can use these tools tomorrow, we need to remind ourselves what our objectives are for real. Um, so if you recall, I, I suggested at a very simple level, 
that the purpose of an airline is to fly customers from A to B. Maybe we should say safely fly customers from A to B. Say uh, safely and comfortably fly people A to B. Do that in a sustainable and safe way. Uh, sustainable business, environmentally sustainable and safe, of course. And each department plays its own role in meeting those objectives. Um, maybe we say customers, freight customers as well as human customers. Um, we need to consider how each department supports the customer through the journey and in doing so identify the objective and then define the risk for each department. Now, um, interestingly, um, objectives are set out by, by large companies uh, as missions, vision, um, values, and targets. Um, and I've picked those words because that's how Vietnam Airlines set out at a very high level, your objectives. I hope I'm still up to date. I hope you haven't changed them. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay. This, I believe, is your vision and mission statement. Correct me if I'm wrong. Please confirm with me. I'm showing a correct slide. Tien? Uh, is this correct? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I, I would suggest this is quite a good place to start for really being clear on objectives before actually doing a proper full risk assessment process. So you've decided, and correct me if I'm misreading this, um, uphold the number one position as the Vietnam's aviation group leader a principal airline of a company, of a country. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, and the objective to become a leading Asian airline of customer's choice and be the main force of transportation of Vietnam as a flag carrier. Uh, we guess so. <laughs> yeah, correct. Correct, okay. Sorry if I'm, I haven't quite um, <laughs> translated this correctly. <laughs> But these are really important because that's set in objective. It's saying you're not just going to be any old airline. You're going to be the principal airline of the country. Um, provide or will remain. Provide diverse and high quality air transport to its customers' expectations. So you aren't just going to fly people. You're going to meet their expectations. Do it well. Create a civilized and professional working environment with various opportunities for career development for employees. You want to be a great place to work that grows people. Is that right? Yes. So that's really important. That's an interesting one because it's saying it's, it's more to you than just flying people. Your objectives are more sophisticated, broader than that. And so when considering risk, you might be considering well, does that influence, does that impact our objective to be a great place to work? That's a legitimate way to consider risk. And the last point I think says, run effective business operation, ensure sus sustainable benefits for shareholders, a return on investment. Yes. A more probably measured financially, but again, it's part of understanding what we mean by risk. It isn't just the most obvious things, it's set out by the vision and the mission. Okay, and hopefully I've got the right slide here for core values. It is core values, yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, Safety is a top priority and the basis for every activity. In a way, it's quite simple for an airline, safety. 
is a core. I remember having a conversation with a very large, very large global scale food company. And I was working for internal audit within the airline. And we invited their internal audit team to come and visit us and just discuss business and discuss how we carried out our activity. And I set out the airlines, what we called our risk environment, which was a map of all external and internal pressures. But right in the middle, we had safety because we had safety, nothing else mattered. And I said to them, of course, you'll have food safety in the middle of yours. And they looked a bit blank. They hadn't crossed their mind that if they had contaminated food, their brand would be severely damaged. Well, some years later, they did have a contaminated food incident, food going to China. And it is really significant for their brand. It's really interesting. It isn't just airlines where safety is absolutely the most important point. Um, but they hadn't, yeah, it was really interesting. They hadn't really, I think because they'd never had a food uh, contamination problem, they hadn't realized just how important that safety message is, that safety is. Mm -hmm. That was compounded by we were supplying food to babies. So, yeah. Customer centric approach, our development tightly links to customers trust. So really think about the customer. So when you're thinking about a risk, a bit like that story I told about wiring the customer, really focus on the impact on the customer, the service, the experience, as much as the safety. Employees are the most valuable asset. All remuneration policies are built fairly and worthily to maintain the cohesion and solidarity of the organization. So again, this perhaps won't come up that often when studying risk, but it is something to bear in mind. Something could impact this, a, a policy, a trend of behaviors that could, a change in culture could impact that. Creativity, correct me if I'm not getting this right, uh, is a business motto. We constantly innovate various business aspects with breakthrough mindset and strive to achieve big success. So again, you could identify if you go through a proper risk process of a behavior or a policy or a structural change that would dampen down creativity. So that's a, that should be seen as a risk. I'm mindful that, of course, we're all in the middle of a pandemic at the moment, and living up to some of these is really tough um, when businesses are under such stress. Responsible airline group. We understand that corporate social responsibility is a business practice to ensure all decisions made and actions taken are in line with social sustainability. It would be good social... Um, good part of society, positive part of society. And again, there may be some subtle changes and decisions made that could in theory impact that. So again, it is something to consider at certain parts of the organization, probably at quite a senior level in this case, to be considered when making a decision, does it live up to these core values, are we creating a situation that could impact these and lessen these or weaken these? So I think it's important to go through these sort of very high level objectives and just be mindful that risk isn't always the simple stuff, the obvious stuff. It can be quite subtle um, and you could create a chronic situation, um, what I mean, a slow moving situation that evolves over time. Um, and I've summed these up. I'm not sure if they were on the um, 
website, but I think it's summed up as safety, customer centric and commercially successful. Okay. Whoops, sorry. Uh, is this sorry correct um i thought i'm i think i'm messing with is this in targets is it no is this values yeah i thought you had one on targets but i don't see it So this one is vision and mission. That's vision, yeah. Okay, I think I've got them all, haven't I? Oh, no, there was another one, which, sorry, I haven't put it in, but it was targets, and I've got top three leading airline group in Southeast Asia in terms of revenue. So this was clearly pre-town pandemic, um, but it's still, I don't know if it's still shown as a target. Um, to be top 10 favorite airlines in Asia, top three airlines in Southeast Asia. So really inspirational goals, um, really targeted being a great airline. And so again, when thinking about risk, when thinking about big decisions, is there a risk to these objectives, to, to these targets? It, it's just illustrates that the subjective this idea of focus and objectives is really a very powerful idea, but it really needs thinking about when you're thinking about risk. What exactly are our objectives? How does my department support those objectives? What are my departments? How do my risks affect my strategic objectives? These are exactly the conversations of thinking that's necessary to make risk management really work well for an organization, really add value. And sorry. And I think this is this is how it's summarized uh, last year, I think it was. Orientation of the of the operations in 2020. Yeah. Um so I might uh, these might be slightly out of date, but I think this is a summary essentially of all these objectives. Um, commercially competitive, service quality, digital projects, uh, and efficiency. Um, yeah, so I was really, I think, the reason to go through these is just to explain that the objective is a very important part of a risk management process, really understanding your objectives. So you're assessing risks in terms of your objectives. Some parts of the organization is relatively easy, like safety, you know, it's really easy, it's safety. In other parts, it's, it's more subtle, it's more nuanced. And the impacts of decisions may be less direct, less obvious. But it's important to really understand what you mean by risk. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering now, is there any comments on that? I apologize if some of them were slightly out of date. I didn't check. We would like to thank you about uh, showing us uh, our uh, vision and mission. We already read it in, uh, <coughs> in the past, but we barely remember it. Okay. <laughs> It's like a reminder for us. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy in, when you're buried in day to day problems, particularly over the last two years, a year and a half, to forget the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just thinking what to do now is just mindful of time. 
you want me to okay. show the quiz? Yeah, I think that would now would be a good time to finish on the, okay. on the quiz. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing. Okay, you stop sharing. I will show the quiz. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Can you see something? Yes. You can see the priest? Uh, no. Okay. You cannot see question one? We're seeing case study situations. Uh, okay. Sorry. I'll share again. Wait for me. Okay, how about now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is the form of the quiz. So uh, do you want me, do you want to explain it? Uh, I'll I let you explain. It's okay. 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 <laughs> so so I was asked to come with um, 10 questions to see if everyone's been listening. Um, it's been quite a long day, I appreciate. So you may have missed some things. Um, so the first question is, um, and I'm sure you all know the answer to this one now. <laughs> <laughs> Please complete the following question or following sentence. Risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on dot, 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 dot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. They will understand this as um, homework. Um, okay. So yeah. yeah. Um, objective. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, is everyone going to be doing this online? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, we just run through the questions. The next question is about the international standard, global standard on risk management. Um, and I've listed <laughs> three standards, they're all real standards, um, or, or none of the above. A C item. C. Okay. Uh, so the answer is, hopefully you'll know which answer of that. Um, then is question three is, which of the following is not a step of a risk management process? So, um, um, three of them are part out of one step, but it doesn't matter. Um, so which of these was not shown in the diagram? Uh, the next question, what are the two axes of a risk matrix? So if you recall, risk matrix is the colored matrix and it's got probability and another axis. So you've got to write in what that axis is. Uh, question five. Uh, why are we interested in objectives when discussing risk management? So that gives you a chance to explain similar to um, question one, but please write in your understanding. That would be really interesting for me to see how people have um, taken perhaps different ideas from my explanations. Uh, what is the first step of a risk assessment process? So that's, I talked about the importance of a particular step. So that'll be interesting and everyone get that. Um, now, this is one for a bit of research on Google or somewhere. The ACAO risk matrix uses three terms, which of the following is not used? You might be able to guess the answer, but there we go. Uh, question eight. Which do you consider the most important risk that your department must consider during the recovery from COVID pandemic? So we haven't talked about pandemic yet, um, but I do, do think we should use it as an example tomorrow. So 
when we've completed that. Um, either you complete this now and see if you change your mind. Um, um, but that would be interesting to see the range of answers before. Right at the end of the course, we can go through and see the range. Um, which combination of probability and consequence results in the highest risk? So very simple matrix, which would be the highest? A minor and very unlikely or a major and likely? And question 10, which of the following risks refers to risk after mitigations have been applied? So um, we've only just talked about that actually, so that should be fresh in people's minds. So, so no difficult questions there, no tricky questions, no trick questions. Um, fairly straightforward, but um, it'll be useful It'd be interesting to see the results of this quiz. Um, are people able to go in and then come back out and go back in? Uh, I don't know where. Sorry, say it again. Yeah, can they pause and go back in? Uh, um, uh, yes, this is done online. So, yes, when they do it, we can see the polls and the answers, like the percentage of how many okay. A, how okay. many. Mm. What the answer is mm. I'm just thinking whether people should, we should ask people to do this overnight or first thing in the morning and then, or to wait until we've talked a bit more about pandemic risk. Oh, uh, it's up to you. Uh, I think it can, okay, personally, I think it can be overnight or okay. early tomorrow. Yep. So, I mean, our class starts at nine, so we have like an hour before class. We, if someone forgets, they can also do this as well. So, okay. yeah. uh, so when class starts, we can have like a discussion based on the answer. Excellent. Okay, great. That sounds good. Okay, that's everyone's homework then. Okay, so I just explained the procedures. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, I will stop sharing now. Okay, so everyone knows what how to log in and uh, yes, it, it's yep. very, it's just a link. They don't have to log in, they just click on the link. Yeah. Right here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we've just got 15 minutes now. So what I propose is I just quickly go introduce you to some of the things we'll do tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, but, but not go in detail. Um, right. Uh, just. Okay, uh, I'm just arranging my screens, sorry. Okay. Okay, can everyone see the new slide? Yes. Yep. Okay, so We'll start getting into some real examples, real scales tomorrow. Um, and one thing I'll uh, suggest is a set of scales for the group. Uh, and I apologize, the titles on these slides are not correct. I've written Vietnam Airways instead of airlines. Please excuse my error. Um, what I've proposed here, so there's the air, I'm sorry, um, is that for each 
um, type of risk. So we can look at risk in terms of operational safety, compliance, person safety, business compliance, financial, brand reputation, customer service and environmental. This isn't meant to be like, you must do it this way, but for, for the purpose of this course, at least I'm suggesting this is one way of doing it. And then we rate consequence using these terms. So in English terms, insufficient, insignificant, minor, moderate, major, severe, and catastrophic, and given them a, a level title. And then described what that means for each type of risk. So for operational safety, catastrophic is loss of an aircraft. Um, some, if you recall earlier on, I talked about an equivalence, uh, a suggested equivalence between say financial and safety. Uh, if you think about that, then you could, can have scales that don't go all the way up to catastrophic because you could argue that compliance, well, it can never be that bad. And so it's quite normal to see scales with gaps in them. So uh, we'll talk about that in some detail tomorrow. Um, and here they are in readable size. Um, and we can talk about whether we think this is right or not. But the idea is to really start to see what it means in practice to write these scales. And then I'm going to present what I suggest is a probability scale that might suit the airline. Um, and that's this one. And again, it could be that you say, no, that's not quite right. We're, we should have it slightly different. Um, and then I'll suggest a real set of scales, what it should look like. And again, we can discuss it. We can pick a risk and go rate it and see if we think it's right. Um, the next few slides are ones I've just shown. And then we can start having an example, do, do some real example risks. I'll, I'll improve this matrix before tomorrow uh, so that we can do two or three real risks. And if I really would like people to contribute to that because I can't rate your risks. Um, and then we'll plot those risks on a risk matrix and I can move these around, maybe show how we can mitigate a risk and lower it. So real examples would pick three real risks and discuss them and explore them. This is just what, what we might look like. Um, and then put them on or show them on a risk matrix. So that's what I'm proposing that we do first, certainly to first half tomorrow. Um, before then, perhaps pick in some post-pandemic risks and explore some real risks to go through the exercise and what that would mean for different departments. So hopefully that will be valuable for everyone. Um, it's a bit of a change from what I'd planned. It's just, it's clearly very difficult with everyone in different locations. We can't have groups debating a particular risk as easily as we would normally. Um, but I think it will still be very valuable. Okay. Um, does that sound useful to, is uh, anything that people were particularly expecting to see um, that I haven't suggested we'll do? Um, Mr. Joran, just a suggestion. So you talk about dividing into groups. Mm. Uh, we do that with Zooms for tomorrow. It will be Think is um, better to discuss like different risks in different groups. Okay. Um, yeah, it's fine. We can do discussion in groups. So if it's for brick zooms on zooms, right? Uh, we just move from uh, you can move from one group to the other. It's just totally different groups. So no one can 
just each group discussed on its own. It's okay. okay. So have done yeah. Are people already in groups? Yeah. Oh, we can. Yes. 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 For tomorrow, yes, we can do that. Break rooms. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I'll prepare on that basis for groups. Then that's excellent. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah. And tomorrow we can do a like more practical approach um, yeah. to what we have learned today. Maybe that's that's probably better for everyone. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I think people will enjoy it a bit more if they can have a little debate. Um, ben, today it, you've been listening all the time and mm -hmm. I'm a bit being a bit mindful at the end of the day where all you've done is listen. So um, uh, yeah, hopefully that will make it um, more enjoyable for people tomorrow. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Um, that, that'll be good. I'll, I'll work up some examples for different groups then. Mm. Yes, that'd be good. Mm. Okay. Uh, um, hello. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, can you uh, share for us uh, some uh, risk matches or uh, real real risk matches or some uh, risk register that uh, some airline uh, use uh, for reference? Yeah. And we'll uh, yeah, and um, uh, talk about the uh, effectiveness of the risks. Yeah. Sorry, I, I missed that last point. Yeah, the, mm, I, I need to uh, talk about the uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, effective of the risk uh, of the mitigation, uh, the risk or some, um, uh, that means that uh, should we have an uh, interval uh, for risk review, yeah, a monthly, um, yearly for review the, the our risk, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Yep, yep, no problem. Yep, I can do that. Okay, any other requests? Not, uh, which I can try to <laughs> try to meet. <laughs> no, we're good. Okay, radio. Um, okay, time is now. Um, for 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 to anyone um i think that's for me that's probably a good point to finish rather than try and start something now with just nine minutes to go um, hmm. okay um thank you everyone i uh, appreciate it's not always so easy on um these virtual meetings uh, and thank you for those points that have been made um they were really good, actually. Each time someone's raised a point, I think it's been a really, really valid point. Um, and it's really helped me to make sure that I've covered some subject or we've discussed something. Yeah, so please, please, if at any point you want to make, if you think I've said something wrong, if you think I've missed something, like the point about environment, for example, please, please speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, teacher. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. See you. All right. See you Bye. tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.